all registered developers. We're over 782,000 as of March 31st, 2023. From more than 200 countries and regions worldwide, smart devices powered by Tuya are currently available in approximately 120,000 stores all over the world. Better insights will bring more value into our lives, make our business and our homes smarter, but it's very important that it's in a secure way. So Tuya will provide it as well, securing the insights on our daily life will actually protect our privacy for the future. Together, we'll enable a future where life is more comfortable and joyful. Work is more dreamlined and efficient. Management is accurate and deep. A lot of people are standing at the moment, so please, if you're around that little section, please feel free to make a friend, give a little seat next to you, just so we can get everyone sat down for this today's session. Thanks. Okay guys, we're going to push back by another one to two minutes, so please feel free to grab a seat and get comfortable and we're going to get started very soon. Thank you. Tuya Smart is a leading technology company focused on making our lives smarter. Tuya does this through offering a cloud platform that connects a range of devices via the IoT. By building interconnectivity standards, Tuya bridges the intelligent needs of brands, OEMs, 
developers and retail chains across a broad range of smart devices and industries. Tuya Solutions empower partners and customers by improving the value of their products while making consumers' lives more convenient through the application of technology. Through its growing commercial SaaS business, Tuya offers intelligent business solutions for a wide range of verticals. The company's platform is backed by industry-leading technology complete with rigorous data protection and security. Tuya partners with many global Fortune 500 companies to make things smarter, including Philips, Schneider Electric, Lenovo and many others. The scope of Tuya's business covers the whole chain from smart manufacturing to the application of smart scenes. At the same time, encouraged by the online and offline channel resources of the service providers, integrators and operators in Tuya's ecosystem, Tuya can help our brand customers to sell smart devices to the entire world. Tuya collaborates closely with Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Apple and Samsung in industry ecosystem. Our platform is one of the first that integrates Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, Apple HomeKit, and Samsung SmartThings at the same time. We enable brands to solve product development problems such as high development costs, long development cycles, and technical challenges and roadblocks, so that even companies with zero experience. So, as we get seated, I just want to firstly wish the warmest of welcomes and thanks to everyone who's traveled today from far why and some from near to be with us today for the Two Year Developer Summit here in Singapore. So, before we start today's speeches, I just want to give the warmest of welcomes and we'll run through today's special guest speakers. So to begin with, let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Ali Xiang, the co-founder and CEO of the Two Year Smart. Welcome, Ali. <laughs> Next, give a very warm welcome everyone to Mr. Ross Gore, the general manager of APAC at Two Years Smart. <laughs> Next up, Mr. Arupa Banchaan, the chief digital officer at SCG. <laughs> Next, we have Mr. Spike Chu, the general manager of sustainability and industry ecosystems at M1. <laughs> Next, please welcome Mr. Jerry Huang, the managing director of APAC at the Wi-Fi Lights. Next, please welcome Mr. Daniel Shane, the Product Director of the Intelligence Business Group at Two Years Smart. Next, please welcome Mr. Sky Cole, the Founder of Auto Life Tech. And then, another warm welcome to Mr. Jay Miyapuri, the Country Head of Singapore and Thailand at ESR. We'll be here shortly, don't worry. And then finally, last but not least, give the warmest of welcomes for another guest who's probably not going to see, Ms. Wu Jin Xian. She is a data scientist at Meta. So please, another warm round of applause. <laughs> so guys, to begin today's proceedings, let's give another warm welcome to Mr. Ross Thor, the General Manager of APAC at 2 Smart, who's going to introduce us about everything connected, everyone sustainable. Welcome, Ross. Everything connected, everybody sustainable. Uh, first, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all the friends coming from Singapore and all the world uh, traveling a long way to uh, join us at this two year developer summit. I'm Ross. So, today I'm very excited to see everybody on the side. So, face to face meeting after a pretty long time due to COVID. And more exciting that, more exciting that you know, the market we are working on together, despite all the challenges over the last few years, remain a strong growth. And you know, in the time to come, we expect an even stronger growth. So, as per uh, GS, uh, GSMA research report, so by the year 2025. The total IoT devices globally, the numbers we will touch, 24.6 
billion units. And in terms of the value, by the year 2027, the global IoT industry in market value could reach 483 billion US dollar. So what a huge market we're in. So in line with the global trend, when we zoom into the region, I mean for the Asian Pacific region, though now the contribution from the region to the global IoT market is around 10%. But the forecast is saying that in nearly five years, you know, the contribution from the Asian Pacific region to the global market will increase up to 20%. So this means the growth rate here in the Asian Pacific region, in the Southeastern uh, South Asia region, will be far higher than the global average. And at the flagship and also the leader market in Singapore, with around only 1% of the population contribution to the region, it takes around 10% of the IoT market share in the region. So there's a reason behind that. Apart from, I mean, everybody knows Singapore is a developed country, is, is a developed nation. So the education level, the purchase power is good. The people's awareness about the new technology, about smart, about IoT is good. Apart from these elevators, a big credit, I think, needs to go to the government. Like a long time back, the Singapore government has launched their Smart Nation initiative. So they're trying to bring the whole nation, the whole society, to be uh, digitalized, including everything, right? So obviously the Smart IoT will be a very important part of this whole journey. Okay, so many exciting potential in the market. I mean, all of our scale are working on. So coming back to Tuya, what, what is Tuya's positioning and what is Tuya's pro proposition? So as a global IoT platform service provider, we help our clients to cater into the IoT space uh, with a low entry barrier and with more efficiency. So basically from Tuya's side, we, our main business is in three sectors. So the first sector, what we call is IoT Pass, and the second is SaaS, and the third queue. So the first sector Pass, you understand, in this sector, we help our client to enable their product, to enable the device to be smart ones. So what we do, we provide a total solution, or you can call it end-to-end -end solution, which including the application, cloud service, and also the network module, which goes into the product to make the product smart. So we have created a very developer and user-friendly platform so that any manufacturer can easily realize the smart products with very less effort. So within a few minutes, we can help the clients create one app. Within a few hours, we can make one more smart product become, uh, become smart as a prototype. And in a, uh, in the time span of roughly three to four weeks, so the products can go to mass production. The efficiency is so uh, so good, that's why in the last few years, only a few years time, we have enabled hundreds of thousands manufacturers, not only in China, but globally, like India, Vietnam, Mexico, Turkey, Poland, all these countries, they have certain manufacturing base. And so far, in the Tuya ecosystem, we have more than uh, 2,700 product categories, more than 600,000 SQs already uh, having a smart version and sold to the global market. So this could be the biggest ecosystem, smart product ecosystem in the world. Not, not only the product, but also the biggest smart product supply chain ecosystem in the world. So this is uh, the IoT Pass, this more device oriented. The second sector we are working on is what we call SaaS, Software as a Service. So this business is more industry oriented, or you can see it's more scenario oriented. What we do is, you know, we provide a total solution combining hardware, a range of hardware, including, um, you know, everything, and also a software, including app, also the web portal. 
for the managers or the operators to monitor everything. So we can make any space smart, like you know, this meeting room, or maybe one building, or maybe one hospital, or maybe one uh, you know elderly care. So any space, even bigger to a industrial park, or maybe even to a smart city, we can have a total solution for that. So this segment is what we call SaaS. The third sector is what we call Q. You can understand is you know we can deploy the whole capability which we have privately for the clients who have the more demand in the data ownership, who have more demand for the customization and differentiation, who have more demand, you know, they have their own ID team to work on many customized applications based on the three uh, the uh, platform. So I will uh, get into more details, like you know, in the different sector, the past, start, and queue. In the last few years, we have developed a few new capabilities. So in terms of the past, in the last one or two years, we have upgraded our past capability to the version 2.0. Version 2.0, the difference is what? Is apart from the general developer platform, which we have already launched many years back, so we give more uh, tools or more platform for the developers to do their own customization. This including the IoT OS from the hardware side, and also including the uh, app SDK, including mini SDK from the app side, and also the IoT core from the cloud side. So that, uh, so the clients can use these basic SDKs or the IoT OS, create their own application, or do many the unique user interface, so that they can be different from others, from the competitors. Um, so just to give a few uh, key study or examples for this. Uh, we do have one uh, client called Schneider. I mean, it's not showing the DVD, but it's uh, Schneider, right? It's a global big group, a Fortune 500. So they have a smartphone platform called Wiser. And if you can see that, if you download the app, all the user interface is totally different from what they could have common user interface. But that is also based on Kuya. So they are using the SDK to do their own customization. And another example is true cooperation. So I think some friends are coming from Thailand. So this is the old, this is one of the biggest telecom company in Thailand. Uh, so uh, what they do true is you know they take the Kuya app SDK and they develop their own app called TrueX. So you can find the TrueX app apart from the smartphone part is powered by Kuya. They also built their own capabilities, like the validated cloud storage services, like the payment gateway by the name True Money. And also, they even incorporate many other subscribed services, like you know, the people can use this app to, uh, you know, to ask for service of you know, cleaning the AC, or even they introduce the education courses. The people can use this uh, app to subscribe the, the education courses and pay for that. So basically, the TrueX app is built upon the Tuya app SDK, and they have made it a more comprehensive and a super app to uh, their, you know, the uh, huge user base. So coming to the Cube solution, this is mainly for the big group, like five, Fortune 500 or the, uh, you know, the big groups, a big company, like you know, they have more demand uh, with data ownership. They want you know every all uh, have to have the fully control of all the data generated through their devices, through their business, and they may integrate with their some other business data to make sure to take the best value out of it. And a few key study on this cube, like you know, we are working with the biggest telecom company in Indonesia by the name Telecom Indonesia. So we launched the Cube solution for them. So, uh, so basically, this IoT platform is running by their own, and you know they have established the strategic partnership with all the major prominent local smart home players, and also they leverage their strengths in terms of offline stores and also the huge user base of the broadband users 
to help them to extend the business from the traditional telecom services to smart home services. Another case is like, you know, we have one client, SCG from Thailand again. Uh, so by providing the cube solution to SCG, on one side, we can integrate the huge smart uh, hardware products from Tuya ecosystem. Also at the same time, they can have their own developed hardware ecosystem and combining the two to offer a very comprehensive total solution to their clients in Thailand and also globally, including Southeast Asia region, including to the household and also to the different business scenarios. So here I want to emphasize that from the I mean, we have our platform from the connection level. We have worked deeply with almost all the mainstream communication protocols, from the short distance to longer distance, from the NFC, UWP, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, wi sound and even like 4G, 5G, MBLT, to all the communication protocols. We have combined, we have incorporated into our OS, which we are built in the hardware. And also, we are embracing the new upcoming META communication protocol proactively. As a board member of the META Association, we are truly a you know, practitioner of the interconnectivity of the global IoT ecosystem. So in this big corner, I think you know, we have displayed the META capability. Our current case will explain more details. I mean, maybe out some time. We can uh, check in the state corner. Apart from the connection level, we do many more things on the application layer also. Uh, like, you know, from Tuya side, we have been working deeply in a few verticals, especially the hospitality, residential, commercial lighting, house, and real estate. So we, in the last few years, we worked pretty deeply on these verticals. We have mature and ready solution for these verticals. And moreover, we have abstract, or we have packaged, or we have modularized some general capabilities of SaaS, like device management or user management. This can be very common, I mean the general features. So we modularize this, and you know, we put on the, you know, the platform so that many developers can just grab these ready uh, modularized capabilities and they can adopt into various and even more verticals. And you know, these verticals can be endless. and be like, you know, industry, agriculture, elder care, hospital, industry park, city. So there'll be endless to that. And uh, you know, especially in the, la in the last one to two years, I think, you know, we see globally there's a huge energy crisis. I mean, especially after the uh, Russian Ukraine war. I mean, everywhere, you know, the energy price goes up in a big way. So we have worked out what we call the smart HEMS, which consolidated all the aspects from right from the power supply, the power generation, and also the power storage, then to the power consumption and distribution. So we bring all these on one common platform. So uh, put all the data on one platform through some automation and algorithm, we can really balance you know, the power supply and the power consumption. So give the best efficiency, hence to achieve a good energy saving, maybe more than 20%. In second of we uh, in the last 22 years, we also work pretty closely with the HDB. I think SPD uh, has the Smart Hub initiative. All the communities SPD will build in the following years. We will have the Smart Hub ecosystem. And you know, under this Smart Hub, there will be different, different smart subsystems, like you know, the water harvesting, lighting, FSC access control, irrigation, many subsystems will be there. So what I'm offering is like, we can unify all these subsystems. We can bring all the data through different different sensors and hardware devices. We can bring all this on one single platform. So that for the uh, town console, they can see everything happening on one screen, one big screen, to bring more efficiency. 
And also another case in Singapore, we work together with uh, uh, Crawford Hospital. So by leveraging the capability of the IoT technology, on one side, the patients can have more convenient operation inside the room. Like, you know, they can use the app, they can use voice control, the air conditioner, they can control the lighting, curtain motor, you know, uh, so bring more conveniences to the patients. On the other hand, you know, for the nurse station, from the back end, they can monitor each and every room more accurately. So if something goes wrong in some particular room, the nurse will get the reminders or alarm on the app also on the web portal also, so that they can go there and attend the patient, you know, timely and more efficiently. Thanks to where various sensors have been installed in the room, like, you know, for detection or SOS. Yeah. yeah, so Tuya is a very open, flexible IoT platform. We also evolve with time. Like from time to time, there will be new, new technology, advanced technologies coming out. We try to blend all this stuff into our platform to make it even better. Like, you know, we, in our, in all the applications from Tuya side, we have gradually added more and more AI functionalities. Like, you know, in the net zero total solution. So we throw some AI algorithm, we can help uh, some commercial building to realize 20% energy saving without hammering any experiences of the users. Because when everything can be automated, once we collect the data, you know, through some AI algorithm, we can make things happen aut automatically. So even without people's notice. And also for the household, to the consumer end, we, are, we can provide one uh, small, very easy energy saving kit consisting of two or three hardware products and built in some the AI uh, uh, capability so that for the end user, what he needs is just one tap on the app so that you can realize 20% of the electricity bill reduction without influence any of your life, your lifestyle or living pattern. Um, so this is pretty much to end my session. So I sincerely invite all the friends here, all the partners, all the developers here to work together closely to bring the new technology, to bring more advanced technology into the daily life, into the society. So let's together make the world a smart world and make people living a smart living. Thank you. Okay, huge thank you, Ross. What a fantastic kickoff to today's event. So, moving on to the next speech, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Alex Young, the co founder and COO of Two Year Smart, who's going to give us today a presentation on PASS 2.0, the productivity hub for sustainable application scenarios. So, please, a warm welcome to Mr. Young. Good afternoon, everyone. We are always very excited to be at CPAC for you know, the, one of the hub of innovation for the entire APAC. And uh, I believe that will be the perfect place for us to introduce any type of new technology and innovation we found there in the market and uh, bring it into the next level. So today I'm going to share that so what we've been doing in the past two years to try to create a new hub for any type of you know, innovative productivity that we need to market. Let's start with the challenge, because as you might know, Tuya, that we are kind of the platform and service providers, so we are happy to see problems and challenges, because we are here to solve the problem, that's our value. And uh, while we dig that deep into the market, we found two major challenges, I mean, all the way around the IoT since the beginning. The first one is extreme fragmentation in all kinds of we found there are so many layers in the pipeline of the industry while we want to build any type of single solution, even a very single one. So starting with the communication protocol, on gross size, you see that at least I have 10. Okay, 
And on the chip architecture, we will have majorly four to five architecture on the chip side in each protocol. And then we have different systems on the chip, maybe four to five. And then usually while our customers want to develop something, they need to integrate different type of the subsystems, maybe 10. And then at least we'll have a multiple applications to different type of the clients, like the end user, maintenance, management, and uh, maybe the service. So which means that we'll have like the 10 times 10 times 5 times 10 times etc. So we'll have a huge mix of options. So when everyone wants to design the solutions, they have to work through the maze of IoT, try to navigate them and integrate all the resources you need. So that becomes extremely hard. Because usually, if we don't wait to know every single pieces or players in each layer of the industry. So that makes IoT kind of like the extremely difficult to understand. The first one. Still, right now, the fragmentation still exists. And uh, I just shared with uh, our friend from SDC, who said that maybe in the near future, there might be a single answer for that. We have to live with the fragmentation. So that will be one challenge. So maybe we can draw a map and help our customers work through that. The first one. And the second one, The second one it will be the security and the compliance. So when we're talking about IoT, we're creating a new way to connect the people thing and people together, which means that we're creating a larger of the networks that's trying to capture data. So once you have a massive data, that will become a new topic that how you can protect the data. So this will be a some numbers from uh, the top tier cyber security company called Palazzo, they show a significant amount of the devices show as the vulnerable for any level of the cyber attack. Which shows that so many of the players right now in the field, they don't have the right you know, professionality to understand that so when they start to build a solution, what type of security technology they should use to protect the solutions. And so we are along with you. And uh, starting from the internet, so we already live with all the virus from our computers for over two decades, or even three. So IoT will have the same path we need to work through. That'll be one part. And another part, with the hidden numbers we do not have, is that based on all the conversations we have with our partners worldwide, majority of the companies who are really involving IoT that realize that compliance will be kind of the major topic they need to conquer in the next two to three years. Because when we started IoT like the six years ago, there's no country, no government starting to pay attention to IoT yet. Because IoT till now is still in the early stage. It's not scale enough for the governors to pay attention to. But starting with about four years ago, from Europe, EU is starting to pay attention to see that, oh guys, since I see there might be a massive data capture from the market using this new technology, we're starting to think about how we can protect our people. And then we found that uh, several regional regulations starting to be in place, starting from EU and then United States and then UK and then Singapore, Japan, China. So compliance is how we can provide a service and technology that compliant with the local regulations become a major issue in the near future. Because if you don't comply with that, which means that all your service might face in a high penalty from some government. So that will be the two major challenge for most of the newcomers by IoT. But most of the time, when I speak to the new partners that uh, target customer criteria, they'll say that, Alex, let me tell you something. First thing, IoT will be way more complicated than my understanding, so I don't know how to put that together. And secondly, and somebody tell me that if IoT is not secure, gosh, I'll take way more risk and way more pain point to kill the pain point you're telling me. So I'd rather not do that. Okay, I said, perfect. 
because we are here to try to solve the solution, solve the problems. So those challenges, whether we can provide something towards that? Yeah. Uh, I'm just show one simple use cases is our IoT path. Ross just mentioned, the path is the platform we built for any developer who wants to develop any type of IoT devices or applications. So it's a universal platform we try to provide for anywhere in the world, in any single vertical industry. And in last month, we just released our version two pass. We're running some major updates on there. I'll share with you that. So as I mentioned, the pass is a universal platform, and it contains, in the version one, will be three major parts. So it's the device development, how we can make this device be connected and be smart. And then cloud storage pre-deployed all over the world that can help those devices to connect it somewhere. And then applications that facing any user. And in version two, we released a new development service we call Mini Apps. It's a new layer of the way we can help our developers to make things easier. And in our version one, we started at the 2015, so literally eight years ago. So the version one, the major task for the past is efficiency and easy. Because back then, nobody believed in IoT. And there's no IoT business yet. So if you want to run a in Singapore eight years ago, none of you will come because you will say that, why I need to listen to something I don't understand and come with a risk? and I don't see the business opportunity there. So in our version one, we have to do a lot, lot of what we call turnkey solution, end-to-end -end solution. So we finish most of the things in-house and offer that as a platform pay to the customer. So for them is that, okay, without investment on the R&D, just plug in my module and we make it work. We really have all the best work in that. So our version one will more focus on end-to-end, -to, -end, to try to do things for our customers. But then, you know what, IoT right now we need to prove it can work out, no matter it's business perspective or technical perspective. So you come, because you maybe part of you are really starting to do the IoT business. And then my customers start to call me every year say, Alex, gosh, I really need some business. And I will not satisfy with your solution anymore. I want to create my own. And give me something so I can create my own differentiation. So on version two pass, our major pass will be flexibility, independency, and diversity. So we started to build a new layer to open up our infrastructure more to allow our customers to be able to develop anything based on their capability as they wish. And so we create, based on the three major sectors we have, and we need to be in a new one because of mini app storage. And the share that we on that one. Start with that, still we have a IoT developer portal. It's a very unique original portal that we provide that cover all the development tasks and toolkit you needed from Studio. And also com combine with all the major work you need to be done to finish uh, application of development, including like the device development, project management, user and device management, after the sales, the online service, OTA, data analytics, storage, etc. So till now, you can still use the same portal for all the upgraded services on past version two. The same portal, but come with a different storage. And on the device side, we have our Tuya OS. So Tuya OS is a standardized embedded system framework come with a phase model on the cloud side that can help those device makers to develop and define and develop any single type of the devices. So we still have the same stuff, but we open more developing toolkit and documentation. And on version two, we release our new IDE, integrated development environment for those device makers 
So cross different chip, cross different protocol, cross different hardware architecture using the same development toolkit to finish your job. We call it 2LV. So for that, we just simplify all those hardware stores. And besides the device, we released a new version of Tuya App SDK, like I mentioned. So more and more customers are not satisfied with the master app or, or standardized app to have developed. They ask them to do it themselves. So we give them an SDK. And on version two, the app SDK upgrade is that we modularize the feature, which means that we have the baseline of the master SDK, but also we release a lot, lot of features as a module of the SDK and running that separately. And each of the feature modules will be running at the vertical team from Tuya. So we will upgrade the feature module separately, which means that we provide more flexibility for the customer to develop their own app without waiting for the baseline upgrade. They can easily upgrade single module on the feature side. So this is also provide more flexibility for the app. And the speed from there, we provide two separate versions on the application development. This is standard one, and then we give it a lighter one. It's a mini app. Mostly for the commercial usage. So many customers say that, I don't want to build the app from scratch. So the SDK is great, but I have to do a lot of work. So how about you share the main body of your app? Just cut the application layer to me. So that's the main app. So for that part, the customer only have to focus on the user experience and the feature. I mean, any user feature. But for the rest of the part, the device management, pairing, OTA, some basic user management systems, they can use in the main body that you have already had. And also, the developer, if they have experience to develop any type of media app, like in Facebook or in WeChat, they can directly migrate that capability into the Tuya media app system. So for that, usually, the customers, they can spend only a couple of days to finish the app. So this is what we deliver on the version two, the media app. So like the, take this medium, for example, maybe some developers think that I don't want to build a master app, massive app. I only want a specific app for this medieval that connect with 30 specific devices in this medieval. So for them, they only have to finish that layer for the 30 specific devices integration and this medieval control. All the, all, what we call public features, we can provide that directly on the mini app. So this is the light version. But remember, once the business goes, we have some hardcore user. They said that I want you to be more open. It's good to simplify my work, but I like to do the hardcore job. So we open the entire infrastructure there. It's an IoT call. So this is a, another set of the development queue only on API. No SDK, so the customer can build in from scratch. For the IoT call, will be all targeted as some typical customer like the telecom operator, like the property developer, and the utility company. For them, they say that the IoT will be part of the business model, but they like to integrate with some other third-party services and their own legacy systems. So they ask the Tuya to open all the infrastructure to them. So they can build a totally differentiated type of use cases with more comprehensive feature set that Tuya cannot provide. Or which I will not provide. Yeah, we open out the call for that. And uh, right now, the version has our uh, version two. We provide more comprehensive APIs on our IoT call, and uh, these APIs will support all <coughs> different type of deployments, including the Tuya hosted deployments as a public service, or the hybrid deployments with the customer's legacy systems or total private deployment. So through that flexibility of our deployment and integration, we can provide uh, independency on the data loop and uh, system integration on the application level and the total diversification for my customers. So through that, 
we try to be more open to meet what we call is the <coughs> internet users as per turnkey solution as a code free experiment or some light developers to do some low code experiment on the development side or from some hardcore users to try to build anything on itself. And for, the, for all that, remember all the platform will still provide the same level of the data security protection and the compliance services. So for the data security, we still invest heavily as an individual team inside Tuya to ensure that we continue to use the right technology to protect all the data and the loop. And we also cooperate with all the world class tier of cybersecurity company to run the regular penetration test and server security simulations to ensure that our solutions are always in the first class. In the same time, we open our you know, bug hunting, bug bugging, bug bounty program to all the white hat global wise for all those hackers to continue to you know challenge our cyber security system to improve ourselves. In the same time we work with the top tier compliance agency and the law firms all over the world to ensure that so we keep tracking all those governors who design the new regulations we ensure that all the services and the procedures we run in the service are complied with those regions. So right now we're already certified with the GDPR from EU, CCPA from United States, and the right now we're in track to comply with the UK. They're gonna run in as uh, in next year and in Singapore too. So we're already complying with the basics. Uh, I mean, most of the popular standards like the EN 303-645 cybersecurity standards to ensure that uh, most of the countries, if they follow the standards, the service we will provide to the customers will comply with those standards too. So that type of things we'll need to protect to ensure that uh, we raise the benchmark or button of the or baseline of the performance of the security and compliance for among the industry. Yeah, so that's some um, cases that we have provided in our past. And then last part, I'd like to share stories. Because technology will be always kind of you know, hard to understand. Here's the story view. This is a use case in Singapore. Uh, we got a call from the partners and uh, telling us that uh, Singapore have 1.3 homes. And 80% of those home owners will um, live in the, they call public house from the government. And they do an estimate that uh, average like a four room public house in Singapore, it will consume around 390 watts and, uh, and kilowatts hours electricity a month. It's a lot, it's a lot. And especially since last year, every single nation is pushing forward to make the country greener, to do more of the energy sufficient. <clears throat> so they that the partner said that, can you do anything about it to reduce the power for the Singapore home? They will say, okay, let's try to work together to understand what we can do. And then we start to dive deep into the Singapore house living to see that what the people have been doing in the home. We found that the first one, at least 50% of the power is being consumed by the air, con air conditioner. Oh, because we are in kind of a tropical country, so we like to be cool a lot. And uh, we have to keep the AC on um, all the time. And then we start to dive deeper to see that how the AC is running. And we found that, okay, AC is not simple as we think. So provide the confidence of the temperature for the, for the human body, there were four points. The first one, the temperature is set on the AC doesn't mean it's a temperature for the room. It's only the temperature for the wind that the AC goes. So maybe the AC is turning to 22 right now, but what would it be or might be 30? Oh, we don't want 30. First one. And the second one, the temperature we feel are not even reflected by the temperature itself on the air, but also reflect them through other factors. The first one, humidity. And the second one is airflow. So when it's too wet, we feel hotter. When it's dry, 
with the cooler. And where there's some wind in some house, we will feel better. So humidity and the airflow, we need to consider that. And the third one is that we found humidified mode takes 30% less than the cooling mode on the AC. So which means that by some time, if you feel, feel cool enough, maybe not in cooling mode running all the time, humidified mode will, be, will help. That is the third one we learned. And the last part we found is that the starting part of AC is way more higher than the weapon mode. So what it means that if we continue quickly to turn the AC on off all the time, it takes way more power. So we need to find a balanced way to keep the AC warm for most of the time, but in a better way. Starting from there, we'll say, okay, now I know better on this part. Let's try to design some package. And then very simple stuff which I put in. So AC controller and some sensors, including the um, telling the human existence, whether we got so we got some people in the house, how many of them, where are they? And then we get a humidifier, uh, no, humidity and temperature sensors telling how the room looks like, not the wind. And then we're adding a fan, the air circulation fan. And then we try to put us aggregate on top of that. Okay, by telling how many people in this room, where are they? And how those guys want to feel. Very cold, cool, chill out, or they prefer to be hot. And by setting that type of target, we try to see that how we can play the AC in different modes, and with the right sensor tell you exactly this is the spot you see, and how you will feel it, and accurately with some fan. Starting with there, and we see that so we can really run the AC different way. And we're starting to apply different set, setting configurations on different people. So maybe I'm a cool guy. Okay, keep these things as cold as it could be for all the time, as long as I'm here. But my wife is, is a hot girl. So she prefer to be hotter. So different people in this role will play different setting and configuration. Through that, we start to deploy the POC in some of the Singapore home. You know what? Up to 54% of the power will be reduced on it. Average, this kind of settings will reduce 25% of the electricity. And the partner feel very excited, so as those you know, testers. So we're starting to, very soon, we're trying to promote this type of you know, solutions for Singapore House. 1.3 million homes, we're looking for help them to reduce the bill and help the government, government to reduce the entire national you know, power consumption. This will be some simple stuff we're trying to do. So, but for all the time, we are not the expert, and I don't live in Singapore, I don't know what those people want, what the customers want. So we always open our capability and our ecosystem. Looking for the developer is the one who understands the pain point in your market, in your vertical, and have your idea how to make it better. And we provide all the technology capability and ecosystem. I mean, the supply chain, the services, all different guys you need from different layers of the industry. We try to put them together and to make your solution work out and complete. So I think that's all I want to share today. I believe that uh, our customers will have more stories to tell in the later parts. And I'm looking forward to find more innovations in Singapore and then with you. Thank you. A huge thank you, Alex, for that fantastic speech. Now, next up, Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Jerry Huang, the Managing Director of APAC Business Affairs and the Wi-Fi Alliance, to give us a speech on Wi-Fi, inherent strengths enabling IoT ecosystems. Please welcome Jerry. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor. Thank you very much. Um, this is me, I work for Wi-Fi. And before I start, I want to tell you a story. It's very interesting. Um, a few months ago, I traveled a lot. Uh, a few months ago, I checked into a very nice hotel with very lovely front desk. Uh, it was late in the evening, so there's no one else. And the lady at the front desk said, after I checked in, and she said, well, sir, we're doing, we're conducting a survey, and we'd like to get some information of you, and please participate in our survey. So one of the questions is like, uh, who do you work for? And then immediately she hand me a piece of paper, sir, this is your Wi-Fi username and the password. And 
what is your family again? I said, why buy? And she's like, sir, here. Here's the list. Okay, this is the username and the password. Half an hour later, she and two of her colleagues are from Jesse was late night because they have very little customer. So three of them trying to explain to me how do I log on to my uh email Wi-Fi. And means that I, I, I've been trying to tell them I work for Wi-Fi actually. So this is very interesting. So who is Wi-Fi? I mean I'm sure you all know Wi-Fi, but what is and um, who are Wi-Fi alliance and what do we do? So if I can make this topic correct, um, okay, I think I did it back work. Uh need some help, please. Okay. Okay. So Wi-Fi, we are basically a standard organization. Who are we? What was the connection between us and the Wi-Fi you use on a daily basis? We are Wi-Fi. All the Wi-Fi standard came from us. Um, the organization was formed back in 1999 until now, 20 plus years. In fact, we're celebrating 25 year anniversary next year. So uh, that's who we are. And our vision is very simple. We want to connect everything, everywhere, and everyone in the world. It, it's not very easy. It's not that easy to do, actually. So uh, our vision and our principal operation is we do innovation, we help industry grow, and most importantly, in order to achieve that, we help accelerate collaboration among the industry. And what does Wi-Fi has to do with IoT? Okay, we all know if you ask 100 people, I guarantee you 99 and a half people will tell you what can I do with Wi-Fi? I can get on the internet. What device do you have uh, that includes Wi-Fi? Oh, cell phone. Oh, maybe AT. Well, not necessarily. Some people don't even recognize AT as Wi-Fi. Uh, cell phone for sure, because everybody is looking for Wi-Fi signal. Uh, actually, I, I wish you have a chance to report that Wi-Fi actually has a lot to do with IoT. Uh, before I go on, uh, I want to show you some very interesting statistics number. Wi-Fi uh, currently has about 900 plus members worldwide throughout the world. And yeah, that does not sound like a lot, right? 900 plus company. However, there was an economist uh, he actually wrote an analysis using Wi-Fi ecosystem, all the members in the world, those members in Wi-Fi, and uh, estimated their produce, their production value, meaning like GDP. His answer is, let me see if I can point this one correct. Uh, which one is the point? Oh, here's the point there. He's actually came up with a solution Last year, 2022, 900 plus members produced equivalently 3.5 trillion US dollar GDP. Our shipment worldwide last year reached to 4.4 billion pieces, not billion dollar, billion pieces. Currently in the world, the in-use devices still in use, haven't broke out, haven't been replaced, still in use device in the world, Wi-Fi device. One, uh, 18 billion pieces. 18 billion pieces, uh, pieces, that means everyone in the world, including the little people that you, you hold in your arm, has an average of about two, maybe three pieces per person. That is my Um We have like I said, 900 plus member company, majority of them are device manufacturer and device, all kinds of stuff. We, but on top of that, we have different industry people. We have, you would imagine, well, we have a chip company, we have solution company, uh, like Kuya is one of the very major contributors to Wi-Fi ecosystem. We also have construction company. We have developer, uh, real estate developer, all sorts of uh, company in 
in the different industry segments participating in Wi-Fi in all different kinds of applications. Let me give you one example. Wi-Fi has a standard that can make evaluation and certification on the largest product you can even imagine. They, uh, that standard is called uh, Home Experience. Certification part of the product is house. If you is capable of evaluating and make certification on the house for the apartment that uh, make sure the wireless signal has no boundary, you know, but uh, it's all effective. So I, I, I will not go into that. That will take a lot of time to explain. But this is what that Wi-Fi industry looks like. In Asia Pacific, we occupy what we represent about half of the membership in the world. And as most of you know, Probably the most common one, uh, the frequency band in use. Uh, 2.4 gigahertz, that's probably the most uh, common one that everybody knows for use. Right now it's coming out with 6 gigahertz, uh, Wi Fi 6E, E as extension, uh, using 6 gigahertz, and the upcoming Wi Fi 7 right around the corner, also heavily using 6 gigahertz. Lots of country already released 6 gigahertz band. And surprisingly, we also have sub gigahertz. That means like, uh, I don't know, like 900 megahertz band or even lower, yeah, depending on which country you're at. Uh, we have up to 60 gigahertz, very, very high frequency band in use. So Wi-Fi has over 30 different programs for what you call, call the standard in different kinds of education around the world to fit all the different kinds of education. But the most mainly used are around here. And this is where IoT used the most. Why can we do IoT? Why, what does Wi-Fi have anything to do with IoT? From a survey on a global average, uh, if we're looking at a smart home, home environment, there are more than 17 devices or around 17 so-called connected devices in our household. Um, I work in, my office is in Beijing, I'm based in Beijing. And in my experience, the so-called smart home in China, that um, on the average, an 80 square meter to maybe 100 square meter two bedroom apartment, we're looking at about anywhere from you know, 30 devices to 50 devices, 5-0, 50 devices connect together. We're looking at from CCTV, from door knocks, a smart door lock, a sensor, um, appliance, uh, for example, like appliance. China shipped over 100 million pieces of the so-called smart appliance last year. Uh, it's very amazing. Uh, so that this is a this is a number that's uh, uh, not very popular or not many people can actually pay attention to it. But these are all the devices we use at home. And the overall growth on the smart location, they consume a lot of data. You have data download, you have data upload, everything. And that's the range for the IoT as 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 long as the IoT application is getting more and more richer, this kind of demand, this data demand, and the connectivity demand is getting bigger and bigger. Um, right now, in the, of course, let me share another interesting data with you guys. In the 5G world, I'm talking about the cell phone, the 5G. Everybody's talking about 5G. Uh, I'm talking about the fifth generation uh, 3G PP, the cell phone 5G. In the 5G world, the wireless transfer data, uh, the data transfer through wireless device globally, over 70% are transferred through Wi-Fi. The mobile network only represents about 20 some percent. Okay, because it's a uh, it's demand and it's a uh, complementary joint solution between the mobile data and, and the wireless data, the Wi-Fi network. So, that's how the demand is growing. So Wi-Fi in this way on the connectivity and data transfer, we are, and also the mass market install base, we become the major uh, foundation for the IoT industry from the connectivity.
revenue perspective, from market share perspective, from data transfer perspective. Oops, I'm sorry. Here's the When we talk about IoT devices, among all the different wireless devices, there are several challenges we're facing. Right? Like I said, in China, I'm seeing 30 to 50 devices in the household. Can you imagine if you connect 30 devices without a standardization in among those devices? How are you going to get it to work? So standardization becomes a very, very important issue. And Wi-Fi is very standard. It's, it's a standard that's been globally used for over two decades. And the interoperability is where the standard is based on. So this is why Wi-Fi become a very, very big and important basic platform for the for this kind of deployment. And the basic connectivity, right? IoT system is often controlled by module. And if you have very small market share with different kinds of application, different kinds of technology, the connectivity part will be a very, very painful process when you deploy an application was 18 billion pieces currently used in the world. It's going to be very challenging for you to find even a more popular platform to execute on. So that's why another reason IoT system is really depending on Wi-Fi. Security, the last thing you want is someone hugging to your, say, smartphone solution and uh, take control over it. Wi-Fi WPA3, the security system, the standard itself, is equivalent to, uh, in the US, we always like to uh, describe it as Wall Street standard, meaning financial standard, which the security level is as high as the military level. And, I'm sorry, there you go. So the WPA3 is a mandatory uh, certification that required when you build the Wi-Fi devices that guarantee the security of it, prevent the hacker. And of course, cost effective. Uh, there, there's a lot of research, especially in some of the underdeveloped countries. Wi-Fi become a very cost effective way to deploy nationwide wireless network. And like I said, uh, from the from the carrier perspective, uh, actually Wi-Fi has a group, has a standard group inside Wi-Fi. It's called carrier network. It's formed by all the major carriers in the world. We're talking about AT and T. Pacific Bill, um, Goish Telecom, Orange, and all those guys, even China Mobile. Um, they are, that task group is mainly discovering um, how to better utilize between the mobile network and the Wi Fi network. So, like I said, in the 5G era, on the wireless data communication, the transfer on the data volume. Over 70% is going to be depending on Wi Fi. So it's very cost effective. And most importantly, 25 years of Wi Fi. Every new standard, when the, when the Wi Fi 6 came out, or even um, at the end of the year, early next year, when Wi Fi 7 comes out, one thing you can rest assured is the backward compatibility. That is a requirement. You never have to worry about, well, the Wi Fi 4 work with Wi Fi 7 devices, it, it has to work. That's part of the requirement and consideration for the standard being developed. So, let me use CSA, which is Maker devices, as, a, as an example, as you all know. I mean, th this, is, this is a piece I, uh, I was told to add it in because a lot of people have very strong interest with Maker, which is a very good standard. Matter deployment, actually, uh, as some of you probably know, has a requirement of qualified matter devices. In order to get certification from CSA, we require Wi-Fi certification as a preliminary requirement. Because um, the application usage between matter and Wi-Fi is different. Wi-Fi is very good in securing network connectivity. So CSA is leaving that part of the job to Wi-Fi, utilizing Wi-Fi certification to complete that part of the foundation. 
so they can concentrate on their final meters. Basically, that's, that's just one of the example. I've seen a lot of cases, a lot of company on their purchase requirement that the product qualification require Wi-Fi certification as a prerequisition. And how do we enhance the IoT experience? Well, like I said, these are more numbers. In the past 23, actually 24 years, like I said, next year will be 25 years anniversary. We have over 30, what we call programs, actually 30 standards. We have over 75,000 prototypes of the certification. And it's very enriching the industry, uh, covering all different kinds of applications in different market segments. Um, another example I can refer to you guys is we're making an interoperability test next month in Beijing. That test is actually the collection of the ecosystem bringing all different kinds of products from chipset to module to end devices, end devices including access point, including IoT devices, including door lock, including cell phone, desktop, laptop, uh, all, all kinds of products. They, they are testing on three different scenarios. One is a home IoT, the other one is a smart, environment, a smart office environment, the third one is actually smart retail product, meaning like coffee shop back there. Okay, it's a combination of people who work all this industry, different segment of the industry company are bringing their product into the lab to do the interoperability test because of the, the actual, the, the real life environment, the deployment required. So this is what we do. And that uh, that has been happening next uh, next month uh, after this meeting. I'm flying back to Beijing to to host that uh, experiment. Uh, so this is what we do. That's why we, we think that the Wi-Fi is actually can contribute a lot, especially in the IoT world. One of the company which I cannot mention the name by our policy, um, they actually are contributing over. I want to say, if I remember the number correctly, last time I saw the list, 133 different kinds of product categories which they use all the time in the home IoT environment to the test. So you can imagine that magnitude of the test, comparability, the guarantee of how all this works in the real life world is something very interesting and very important. So basically, that's what we do and who I am and what we work on. Feel free, um, I'm going to be here. Any further questions, um, feel free to reach out to us. You can ask two young people to find me or contact information is right here or anybody wants to add a WeChat because I'm based in Beijing. WeChat is probably easier for me. Um, whichever, we're here to answer the question. And by the way, we are a non-profit organization, so we're very neutral. Thank you very much. Huge thank you to Jerry for that fantastic speech. Now, let's welcome to the stage Mr. Daniel Shane, the Product Director of the Intelligence Business Group at Two Years Smart, who's going to give us a presentation on business value creation under technological evolution. So please welcome to the stage Mr. Shane. Yeah, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Daniel. I'm Daniel Shan from Tuyang Intelligence Business School. Um, quite honored to have this opportunity to give up with you here. And my team is mainly focused on the promotional market. So today, I'm going to give a brief introduction of the promotional solution we can bring to the market and uh, what we thought. Uh, okay, let's jump into the topic today. Yeah. Now, first of all, I want to show some uh, reports. Actually, this is a report from a sort of research institution, Transformer Science, about the number of IoT connect devices worldwide in different vertical industries from 2019 to 2030. And according to this report, uh, we can see that uh, the, compared with the 2019, uh, the, the number of IoT connect devices is expected to double in 2023. 
and portable in 2030, uh, with nearly 12 billion connect devices around the world. And, uh, you know, the, the connection between the industry, the, the, the devices can, will be inter integrate or generate the, the industrial innovations and create huge values. And among them, gas, water, electricity, and energy uh, related industries, uh, transportation and storage industry, and commercial accommodation industry on large portions. Uh, what, need, what else we need to pay attention to the uh, cross uh, industry connection needs and uh, huge potential market opportunities. Uh, the second report is from McKinsey. Uh, about the global distribution of North value of IoT in 2030. And according to this report, the large share of economic value of IoT uh, will be generated through operational optimization with nearly 51 potential in this case. Uh, it is followed by the human productivity and health with both 50 potential. So, and we can see that using IoT technology well, we can try to efficiently uh, reduce the cost, no matter actual composition cost or energy consumption cost. Um, beyond that, we can create a more comfortable, safer, convenient, and you know, electronic viable and dynamic society. And yeah, if we put the ground the two reports together, we analyze them, we can see the the specific and monetary economic value clearly. And, and I can see reports to that. This scenario of best will revolve around people's life and living spaces from homes to offices and work sites and the city places, such as auto, traveling, vehicle, and some other kind of commercial spaces. And among them, so the, the economic value of application of the, the work site and city related spaces is very common and remarkable. And but, but when it comes to the smart city or city related applications, uh, we know that Singapore uh, have an initiative and uh, my nation uh, is around, organized around a certain principle to connect, collect and comprehend. So that is very pragmatic and, and quite scientific. And from the perspective of IoT technology architecture, it's also very correct. Because you know the, the connection is the foundation of intelligence. And the application based on the device connection and data collection can contribute more innovations. So in response to the different kind of smart scenario needs of the industry, we Chuya, we provide a wealth of developer capability components to the developer to get them to uh, see the market opportunities. Um, if we consider the IoT platform as you know, multi literal optimistic systems, so what kind of capabilities do we provide to the developers? But firstly, it is necessary to provide IoT and industry path capability to them to enable normal operation of device, applications, data, and and some other services. And secondary, we provide comprehensive developer tools and API document, documentation to enable the, the partners to develop their uh, platform, uh, software or applications independently and efficiently. And of course, we show the ecosystem of Tuya, and some applications can meet common needs will be pretty integrated. And all the solution is or are combined with hardware and software. And as the infrastructure of the architecture, we have to provide both an era device access and IoT connection services for the partners. Actually, right now, we can support multiple uh, protocols for the IoT devices, not only the consumer devices, but also the commercial equipment. You know, for the consumer side, which is the biggest advantage of Julia, and Actually, in the past few years, we do a lot of efforts. We have done a lot of work on the industry specific reasons. So, based on the industry capabilities and the platform, uh, the developers, the partners can talk the uh, cross-brand and cross-category access 
have a benefit. Uh, you know, in the actual projects, uh, there are a large number of uh, the existing or the old equipment being reduced uh, due to different kind of reasons or different kind of the concerns. So, for example, the, the cost of revolution concerns, maybe the, the cost of right of the, the facilities. So we need to figure out and be the solution for the developers to, to enable them to see the uh, uh, to, to meet the needs of connection of the old and existing facility. So, yeah, we can do it. And in this regard, Chuya will provide age computing services to the developers. We call it Chuya H, or the short name TH. And actually, at present, we have a series of age computing gateways which all have undergone the rigorous testing and verification for different kind of requirements of different industry scenarios. And with the age computing gateways, on the one hand, we can rely on rapid response to the local events uh, with liable local operations, uh, even without network, or in the condition of weak network or, uh, or network system. And on the other hand, we can support multiple industries, mostly local, such as PNS, Batman, Motorbus, Dali and some other public props from uh, many uh, famous traditional manufacturers. And beyond that, uh, we can support uh, AI service, I mean, artificial intelligence event capability services to the end users to have a more intelligent and uh, more efficient uh, experience. Well, as the, you know, as a service provider, a platform service provider, we, we integrate uh, the industry's most big hardware from top ranks uh, into our ever-expanding hardware ecosystem. And right now, for the industry's most big hardware ecosystem, it already includes 21, actually more than 21 categories of devices from over 100 ranks. And it only takes about two weeks to access a lot uh, brand new devices into the system, so more and more brands and devices will be included. And yes, we open the, the ecosystem to the developers, the partners, and all the products in the product library or gallery uh, can uh, are with uh, you know, standardized access methods. So it can show the different amount, different manufacturers, different contents perfectly. And you know, in the past period, the developers they take a lot of time and efforts into adapting to different platforms and you know manufacture for different products. So for some angels, especially for the application innovations, it's, it's kind of just a time. So we can release them, we can allow them to pay more attention to the uh, you know industrial application innovations or improving the, the overall experience of their product or solutions. Yeah, you know, we wanted to make sure and ensure the partners to have rapid response to the, the changes in market. So we provide a complete developer application enablement tools as well, including also for device management, operation, um, scenario orchestration and application integration tools. Uh, what else? Um, graphical data dashboard configuration or customization services or tools. Um, maybe I can give you uh, uh, examples of uh, these uh, real success cases from one of our partners. They are uh, a group of uh, uh, real estate. They wanted to complete to integrate the, you know, the, the parking systems from eight brands which used it in their projects within the group. And by using the you know, uh, industry capability of Trulia, they complete the whole developing and landing uh, works within less than two months. Well, when Trulia, we, we think about the spatial digitalization services or solutions. Actually, we do believe that different open living spaces have different digital needs. So they need to be analyzed separately and then connect 
see, you know, interconnect together again. So when we think about uh, what kind of solution we can bring to this scenario, so we, we divide the space into uh, from living space uh, to uh, walking space, commercial spaces, and city public spaces. Uh, actually, we need some typical uh, dimension uh, spaces of them. You can see on my uh, on the uh, slides. And we started the you know the connection at different amount. Well, when faced with uh, you know uh, the, the market competition, our partners want to can provide nature out of the box something like Chinese solution for them. Uh, they can just use it, so they don't have need to to build a spatial digitalization from scratch. So therefore, on the one hand, we keep reaching our product metrics. Uh, from different kind of label uh, of spaces, as I just, just mentioned. And on the other hand, based on the industry middle uh, platform and the free combination of the application, so the partners can provide specific solutions to their target customer from your mind. And, you know, for commercial scenario, usually they have higher requirements for the platform Reliability, stability, uh, security, and privacy, privacy compliance. So, for different kind of the project types and sites, we can provide or we can offer different deployment methods, or public cloud, or private cloud, even the local server implementation services. We are very confident about our robust platform capability and flexible deployment methods to meet the core needs of different types of those customers. And I'm going to uh, bring down uh, some typical industrial solutions we can we have found around spaces. Uh, the first one is to your house and real estate solution. It's meant for the, the newly built high-tech residency. And the, the, the open renewable and the existing community revolution or the future digital um, you know, from the, from the perspective of the spaces, the home is part of the community, and the community is the whole of the city. We, we want to uh, realize two-way communication among the families, and city, the community, and cities. And organic linkage uh, of them with more digital services, uh, central uh, of people's life. So, actually, in two-way house and real estate solution consists of two parts. My home as my community. Yeah, uh, we, we have to we want to uh, be more uh, useful experience for them. Uh, from the perspective of the services, we do believe that you know my home will not just give the smart control services to the for residents. So uh, actually, it need to provide uh, the services family oriented including smart controls, so the smart home control services, and also including the entertainment, even the community welfare, even the, the public affairs to the resident. So among them, to meet the needs of the resident to obtain smart devices is the basic effort. And to enable the resident can enjoy the, the social uh, or the community service online is advanced. And beyond that, to, to enable the residents or citizens to, to enjoy the government service online is essential. So, uh, we work with the local uh, partners, such as uh, the local governments, uh, real estate companies, uh, home builders, and other kind of uh, partners to, to launch this uh, solution. Actually, we have launched uh, hundreds of the successful cases or projects in dozens of cities. And I'm looking forward to see more and more success cases in Singapore uh, with our with our solution as well. Well the second solution I'm going to bring today is GRPMS solution. And it is also based on a powerful uh, ecosystem hardware and we can deploy deployment capability uh, with standard purpose for, for adapting the, the traditional subsystem of building 
and provide the, the users or the customers uh, flexible system options. Wire and wireless, both are okay and available. And, you know, well, from the uh, report that uh, the solution can provide for uh, volume advantages from the inside into the energy, energy and data, uh, data health, and then to the exclusion of the facility control or building automation, and then to the, you know, the projection of energy health or energy behavior and and you know the, the no carbon strategies. And what is more very important is, is the prediction of uh, of the optimization of carbon tracking and management to to realize to realize net zero emissions. And at present, our Chuya uh, uh, PMS solution has been widely used in different kind of buildings, uh, such as landmark towers, uh, headquarter office. Buildings and some um, uh, facilities, buildings, uh, libraries, and so on. Now, when we take, take an eye on the back on the you know traditional BMS, there are some typical ten points. First one is temporary uh, system. They are set up and truly separate. All these partially integrate with the existing side, chain side systems. And the distributed systems regarding the, the high trend you know, cost that lead to the low usage. And the traditional uh, BMS systems, the automated control uh, based on the actually based on the timers. So it's very hard or we cannot to to, to change the automation based on the own size conditions by implying the real-time system of devices. And beyond that, AI, artificial intelligence, and data service, we don't need to think about it. But to the PM, PMS system, we, we organize around people, buildings, and operations. And all the subsystems will be integrated on a single platform, so the, the operator can have centralized experiences. And beyond that, we can support AI services. For example, uh, you know, in the subsystem uh, of the uh, BMS, uh, we call the motion lighting. And uh, we can give the uh, family oriented uh, or, or team oriented and comfortable and great a uh, light environment with low carbon uh, uh, schedules. You know, actually, uh, uh, these days I went to Singapore. I actually introduced the, the first time I went to Singapore. I drop the drop off the taxi uh, in, in the car park lot. I, I see a lot of the car park lot lighting open day and night. So maybe we can do some uh, upgrades, environmental friendly application on these kind of scenarios. And yes, beyond that, we can work with uh, work closely with the traditional PMS systems from other manufacturers. So it is also very practical and cost effective. And the third one is, uh, is the solutions we have launched in the most of competition uh, scenarios. We are hospitality and residential solutions. Uh, we are hospitality solutions is suitable for hotels, uh, Airbnb, uh, service apartments, and location rentals. And we are hospitality solutions apply for long-term rental scenarios, such as student housing apartments, uh, cost of living, or you know, the level of dormitory and some other similar scenarios. And in the in the Tuya hospitality and residential solution, we developed and have launched uh, a lot of features around the common accommodation scenarios. And on the one hand, they can highly improve the, the efficiency of the cost of the resident. And on the other hand, we can work to improve the you know the to increase the revenue and reduce the cost. And at present, the, in our platform, we have covered over uh, uh, 5,000 property uh, with you know, 150,000 units. And to be honest, on average right now, 
every month about 10,000 and 50,000 new loans will be ended. Well, uh, with our solution, they can uh, not only to improve the efficiency, but also to improve the environmental reputation and contribute to the ESG. Because you know, when the smart technology become prevalent, the, the, the operators are making the changes in providing you know, uh, convenience to the to the residents uh, while providing the uh, the, the convenience based on the support. You know, the, the residents and, and the hosts they want to have freedom to move around, but the operators and the managers they want to provide convenience based on the the protecting your asset, assets. So, to, for example, here we provide access control solution with uh, access control devices, which is very cost effective, easy to install and maintenance, and uh, to provide a wide control method for the for the operators, for the managers, for the residents and other kind of staff. Uh, without containers from desk services uh, or with the digital key to the specific areas and rooms. Well, uh, indeed, this is not an uh, example. This is a real case from one of our partners, Centurion. Uh, it, uh, it is a listed company in Singapore. Uh, they have been in position of a, a foundation industry with, uh, since 2011, uh, they are developing and operating uh, first line branded naval dormitory in Singapore and Malaysia. And they well branded student housing accommodation business in Australia, the UK, and the United States. And of course, beyond this kind of a solution, we can meet the more much narrow needs of different industry. Uh, with integrated solutions such as campers, uh, high tech park, calm, uh, scenic aerial, factories, and so on. And at last, I would say that uh, technology makes the commercial spaces better. And too, yeah, we wanted to work with the partner to, to give more uh, business value to the, to the market. So we wanted to work with all guys together to, to, have, to achieve the local opportunities. Uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to show today. Uh, we maybe we have uh, we can have a free communication after some summit. That's all. Huge thanks to Daniel. Now I believe we might need to start a minute of time to make some technical adjustments, but in the process of doing so, let's please welcome our next guest, Mr. Apirut Vansha. What he's going to do today is give us a speech on the five secrets to making a smart home a consumer-friendly, inclusive, and sustainable solution to everyone. So just give us a minute, guys, as we're just changing over the laptop, and we'll be ready to go very shortly. So please, guys, let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Aparo Fancha. Thank you. Okay, okay. Okay, so we have, good afternoon, I think. Um, we've been going on for hours now. So I'm going to do something to help play you out a little bit. Most people 
don't really understand, you know, or perceive the value of smartphone. And that's become a problem for technologists like us because if the consumer doesn't want your technology, then you're going nowhere. Um, we saw what Steve Jobs did with um, personal computer in the old days when he set up Apple. We saw how, what he did with the smartphone. But compare that to IoT like smartphone, the complication is on a different level. You're not talking about buying just one smartphone and figuring out how to install apps. You're talking about 10 to 10 of devices that the consumer needs to put together. Not to mention that um, they don't really understand the meaning of these other devices. So we're going to share that, right? So in Thailand, we set up um, a new concept. Uh, and we introduced a brand called, a brand called Mai, right? So this is to be um, a new smartphone brand that tried to take a different approach from what we've been doing for the past years. Um, we introduced ourselves as the sommelier or a friend, someone you can walk to and just tell them you know, what you want about smartphone and we figure it out the technology portion for you. So today I'm going to spend just 15 to 20 minutes to share with you our secrets or at least what we think is going to work. Five secrets to making smartphone a more consumer friendly, inclusive and sustainable product for everyday people. Number one, don't sell the devices, but let them know the value, right? So what, what they want to do, not what they want as the devices. So instead of focusing on the technology, you know, being camera, sensor, actuator, the edge computer itself, we focus on many people have. So we, we take a different approach to, uh, you know, the IoT, smartphone uh, area. So what we do, we, we say, we don't sell, we are not selling you devices, we sell you value packages. And we try to categorize them into a more, you know, easier to understand. So starting with feeling or lifestyle, right? And followed by caring, if you have someone, you want to look after your mom, you want to look after your pets, and then well-being, so good quality of air, uh, good quality of water, uh, your bathroom is not so humid, um, it's drier, so that, that's the well-being. And the last one, last but not least, saving. Uh, how can you save you know, your bills, electricity bill, uh, mostly the air conditioning, how can you be more efficient in energy consumption, ESC, or kind of that. And, and these four categories will consist of what we call product packages, right? For example, like, um, mom carrying package, or the movie thing is one of the lifestyle package. Um, adaptive lighting is one of the packages that will help them save um, the electricity bill. Uh, so yeah, has something very similar, they call it uh, daylight harvesting. So basically, if you look at the lights in this room, they are all turned on in the, uh, in the same time equally. Whether they are external light coming or not, the light doesn't care. So adaptive lighting will allow them to uh, to give the line next to the window so that they save on electricity, for example. So these are an example of how we try to package the value proposition to the consumer differently from just selling the devices. And it's actually come in a package. Um, they don't need to care what the devices are. When they get the package, um, our installer, our partner will go to their residences and install it for them. So this is how we uh, we want to do. Uh, I'll give you an example of the adaptive lighting package. So that will be the starting pack, right? Starting pack will have um, the edge computer, and in this case, it will be like a light sensor and a couple of the you know, smart box. And then later on, if they want to expand, they can, they can get the upgrade packs. So they can add more light, they can add more smart switches, they can add more sensor. And then there will be the add ons. So if they want to be more, Advanced. Later on, they can get, uh, let's say, present sensor instead of a motion sensor, for example. But this is how this is the way we offering this into um, the customer houses. And we, we just started doing this for a couple of months, as actually less than six months. But so far, we have thirty thousand residences also in our backlog and about to be installed. By next year, I think we will come up to maybe fifty thousand residences and hundred thousand k to the end of next year. 
So the concept could be working people start getting um, the value of smartphone, and most importantly, uh, they said it, it's less, a lot less scary. And they, they don't need to worry about the technology itself, and they understand the value. Um, of course, on the on the upside, uh, working with Julia, we will try to make it have more consumer like, more user friendly, instead of police of devices that they don't understand. Uh, we try to map this into rooms, spaces, scene, and lifestyle to make it a little bit more understandable for the consumer. So that's my secret number one. Um, make it a more consumer friendly value packet instead of selling uh, devices. Now I'm going to show you uh, a short uh, commercial video that we try to make it more consumer friendly and, and just show them you know, what smartphone can help in a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, these are short commercial video. I'm sorry that they will be in time, but they are in this caption that hopefully you can read and read along. Me my, me too my. Alexa, play me. control ออกจากบ้านก็ไม่ต้องห่วงว่าจะลืมอีกอะไรอย่าไม่ต้องห่วงว่าจะไม่มีใครช่วยดูแลอย่าไม่ต้องห่วงว่าจะไม่มีใคร
the deposits from the customer. But it doesn't stop there. On the S side, we also work with Tuya uh, via SDK so that we can integrate devices, of course, from the Tuya ecosystem, but not limited to that. We can, we can integrate with devices from other brands, especially uh, appliances, right? If you work with Tuya, you know that Tuya has 500,000 K SKU on the smart home IoT side, but on the smart appliance side, um, consumer or customer might want to use that on you know, fabric brands. And with uh, Meta coming in, I, I think the speed will be very really exciting but to see where it's going. Right? But Tuya is very flexible and really open. They are um, influencer of the matter themselves, so that, that's a good way to go. And on the, on the app side, you have choices. You can use the smart light, you can use the SDK that we really have, or you can, you know, we offer also our, our version using the SDK, make it more consumer like application. So the position of our brand, powered by Julia, is that we can work with everyone and we give you freedom, you know, freedom of choices. Whether or not you want smart mobility, you want the appliances, freedom of brands, whether or not you are, you know, you Apple people. Google people or you Samsung or Huawei, we can make it work um, according to your brand preferences. And most importantly, the style. We don't talk about this too much because we are technology people, but people have different style preferences, right? So we, we give them, we say your style master. So for example, the user experience options, if you like touch, you know, if you like high technique touch, you can have a touch CD. But you are, if you're old school and you like to have button that you can press and you know that you press it, we have a tech house in it. If you like the, the dark mode like myself, I like everything black. But some people may, might want to have something more white. Uh, they want, you know, interior that a little bit lighter. We have the dark TV, we have the white TV. If you want to go fancy, you want to have your smart switch uh, in gold. Uh, we can go fancy with you too. Um, so, so that the uh, freedom of style that we provide, and of course, the price level, how much you want to pay for your smartphone. Uh, if, if you look at the automotive uh, industry, uh, you have people carrying up a supercar, but I can't provide the same thing for smartphone options as well. So that, that's the thing. The other thing is the freedom of priority, uh, sorry, of privacy. GDPA, just like in Europe and US, uh, is a very big thing right now. And the number one, one of the, the key reason for people not to want to use the smartphone is the concern of data privacy. Uh, for example, a smart speaker like Alexa, Siri, in Thailand is not doing that well because people believe that they are listening to them, right? They sleep on, sleep on them, listen to what, what they talk. I have a customer, a big real estate brother in Thailand, come to me and say, I want a smart speaker, but I want it to be offline. I want it not to be connecting to the house that I can tell my customer that um, your privacy is safe. So we, we take a different approach to you know what other people is doing. We don't just put gateway, but we by put in the edge computer so that we can we can support for the offline world. Uh, so customers have the freedom of choice if they stay home and they want to look at uh, their children on the next door, they can do an offline video more. So it's the only land and Wi-Fi doesn't go up to the crowd. But once they leave house, um, they go to other country, they want to check out on their parents, then they can choose to be the, the crowd board. Right? So that, that's another thing. Freedom, freedom to be online, freedom to be, be concerned about your privacy. And then the other thing is, you need to make it easier for them. Um, they're not going to buy a bunch of devices and try to connect them together, even though Wi-Fi is very easy this day. But trying to connect your smartphone to Wi-Fi is totally different from trying to connect 20, 30 devices to the same Wi-Fi. Not to mention when you suddenly change the Wi-Fi provider, you change the password, and you need to go through the whole thing again. That's, that's a nightmare for consumers. So we provide full service from A to A, from design, installation, after sale, configuration, and so on. And then we have all the channels that they can engage with. They can engage with us through the application, our online channel and social channel. Um, the other thing that you know we are very happy working through ya is we need to ensure that it's secure. We saw a slide earlier that uh, security is one of the you know the key concern. Uh, if you were a hacker, um, IoT would be 
your hamburger will feel happy because then you can easily gain access to the physical devices. And that, that's, that's the easiest way to have something, right? So with the edge device, uh, with Tuya technology and also AWS's uh, new glass technology, we combine these technologies so that we can look after all the devices uh, inside our customer house. I mentioned to you that next year we're gonna, we're gonna go up to 50,000 K uh, residences. That will be more than one million devices out there that we need to make sure that every single one of them is being safe and over properly. So that, that's, that's something that we need to provide uh, to the consumer. Um, not only CTO, but Venezuela. Also on the car side, of course, we use TLQ in conjunction with uh, AWS IoT Core. Our, our platform is called Trinity. Uh, Trinity is working very closely with um, TLQ to allow us to be able to manage, to monitor, and to do something like over the air update, um, liquid uh, diagnostic, and so on. So that's the kind of data -to interview that we, we believe is necessary to make smart home uh, a mainstream product for everyone. Um, the next one is the live mindset. Um, people talk about ESG sustainability a lot. So when you're coming up with a new brand to make it more consumer this day, you need to be able to say, we're not just a technology company, uh, we are more than that, right? So for us, from the get go, my it is going to be an IoT ecosystem for at least the Thailand, hopefully for the region and for the world as well. We have many initiatives that relates that to um, ESG and SDG 70. The first one called BIT, which is um, stand for Body Thailand. So we are opening this technology up to third party developer, device developer, software developer in Thailand to be able to work with us. The second, uh, BIT is going to be a one-stop kind of platform for people who like to jump into the IoT business, being smart home, smart city, or smart industry, to, to just come with passion and idea, and, and we have the ecosystem already built for them. We will help them to do incubation, uh, technology development, optimization, production, and most of all, we have the market for them. So through my brand, we have the market for, for this technology to be able to you know, quickly go to the market, get for sure, and get more value added. So that's the first initiative under the uh, ESD for mine. The second one is called Creative Mind. We, what we're trying to do is to combine the soft power, um, the creative economy, with the tech power, with the digital economy. So we work with um, SME in Thailand, we work with designer in Thailand, um, and we try to offer something different to the market. If you look at IoT market uh, at this point, you know, like from Tuyara, Xiaomi, Boeing, you, you see like gadget like devices. They are very, very useful, very high tech, but they kind of drive from the human perspective. So we try to offer a more crafted design item that's really, you know, to work to your technology. So why can't smart thing also be good to pick? So that, that's the, the creative mind concept. And so next year we are hopefully we going to see this. We're gonna you know show this thing off and, and see how the ball might be getting excited to get you know a, a furniture designer item that looks very good but also smart, interactive, and intelligent. The last one um, I talked to you about the package, right? Um, being an Apple fan, my, my house is full of boxes, you know, from the first iPhone, the first iPad, the first MacBook, until today. Uh, the box is so nice looking that we, we don't want to throw it away, but yet it's become something useless, you know, inside our house. So when we come up with my, one thing that we ask ourselves is, what can we do with the boxes? So instead of even just, um, you know, take a box, we give them organizer. So basically, once our uh, installer take our devices and install in their house, this block become organizer. You can use it in their bathroom, in their kitchen, in their bedroom. And it's all recycled. So the box itself uh, made from rice, uh, rice, what do you call rice shells uh, of that in, in Thai. So it's, um, this is to help reduce the throwaway uh, waste and also using 
recycle material and we can help uh, value add the agriculture segment in Thailand as well. So that, that's the thing that we're trying to do uh, on the sustainability side. So there you have it. I think that, that's our attempt at least um, to try to take a different approach on IoT technology and make it more humanized, make it more consumer-like, and make it more um, inclusive and sustainable. We love to work with everyone, so if, if you are interested in this concept and would like to join us, whether from the supply side, from the developer side, or from the demand side, if you'd like to try it out, please feel free to, to come talk to me. And actually, we are not, I'm not alone now. I have my team here. Please raise your hand. So, Kuntam there is the business developer from my, uh, so we have many people in Thailand. So, please, you always, you know, can come talk to us. So. Hopefully, you know, smart home will become a mainstream consumer product and we hope to see smart home as the new normal as part of everyone's um, houses or condominiums. So join us and be a mind reader. Thank you. Huge thank you, Andrew, for that fantastic speech. So once again guys, we need to do some quick adjustments over to the laptop, so please bear with just for about 30 seconds to a minute as we introduce our next guest speaker for today. Some of these technologies to achieve these sustainable goals for us. 
right? So taking a step back, why does sustainability actually matter in real estate, right? So some of these things are not pretty, right? What you see on the slide here, it's not pretty, right? The, the one on the, on the leftmost actually is this year's data for ocean temperatures that have been recorded over the last few months. And as you can see, the 2023 number is looking very, very scary, right? And all those lines that you see below it are from the last 45 years. All of a sudden, this year, you see a complete divergence in terms of ocean temperatures, which coupled with you know, other global weather events like El, El, El Nino, completely take you off, off, you know, off track, right? The other one in the middle is actually just where global temperatures are. I mean, it's been pretty hot in Singapore over the last few months. But over the, over the summer, all across our region, in Vietnam, in Philippines, in China, in Japan, temperatures are basically touching levels that they have not touched since we actually began recording temperatures you know, close to 100 and, uh, you know, since the 19th century, in fact. Right, so 130, 140 years ago, right? And the last one, of course, which is an effect of all of this is that your Antarctic ice is melting at a faster pace than ever before. And so all of this is very, very, very real to us. Now, the truth is that we, as developers, construction industry, actually contribute close to 40% of global emissions. Right? So it's a big offender when it comes to greenhouse gases. And as a result of that, you know, we need to therefore take a lot of you know, big steps to try and arrest that. And the impact that we can have is also big. Right? So basically, of one, you see on that, that chart on the, on, the, on, the, on the right, on your right side, a 1% reduction in the carbon footprint of a building. Right? Just 1%, a building like this one can actually impact 100 tons of carbon dioxide released into the, into the atmosphere, which is the equivalent of 100 flights to New York. It's the equivalent of you know, 50 years of consumption of you know, meat, dairy, etc., which you know, there's a fairly big movement of you know, let's go vegan, let's, let's turn vegetarians, it has an impact on, you know, on, 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 on the environment. Or actually, it's basically about, you know, uh, 30 years of you driving your car. 1% reduction in carbon footprint, right? So then, you know, the question we ask ourselves, so what exactly, you know, can impact can we have, right? And we break down this problem actually into two, uh, two, two steps. So one is actually your embodied carbon, right? Which is, which is basically that, that dark pink, light pink side when we are building the building, and all of the materials, all of the transportation. The bigger chunk, which is actually three, two thirds of the impact, is your operating carbon, right? So all of the cooling, water, uh, energy that you require in the building is two thirds of the issue. Now, what you can actually do by going to an ultra low energy building is actually shrink this by a huge amount, right? So what you can basically do is you can half the operating footprint from, uh, so when you, the pie that you see on your right side, the reason why the building material and the, the, the repair and replacement is, is increased is because we have really shrunk the operating footprint that you have. So the biggest impact is going to be operations of the buildings, the amount of energy that you use, the cooling that you use, and, and so on. But there's a catch, right, because all of the embodied carbon is today's carbon, right? This building, it's a brand new, relatively brand new building built over the last three or four years. All of the embodied carbon, even though it was one third of the, the carbon over the lifetime of the asset, was all released from 2019 to 2022. The operating carbon is going to be released over the next 30, 40 years, right? So when you look at this chart here, that big pink box on the left, is actually the carbon that was generated when this building was built. And this data is not exactly for this building, but this building, Capra Sky, is a good representation of a uh, gray office building for which this data was put together by, by the Leti Institute in the UK. So what do you do, right? And the way we actually look at it is we want to do both, right? Let's take solutions 
to impact the embodied carbon of buildings while you're constructing, as well as operating carbon solutions. And, and you know, I won't go through all of the items here. I'm sure you know, we can share the presentation with you if any of you are interested. But there are about half a dozen to a dozen things that are very easy to do when you go into this space. And we at ESR are acting both, right? So how do we decide what we are going to do? Right? So there are two main ways we decide where we want to invest. One of them is purely financial, right? So payback period. Now this is something that we've implemented in our building here in Singapore, where we've gone from your normal inverter uh, aircon technology to a, this, we're actually working with a Singaporean startup called Ecoline, where they actually or attach uh, thermal heat exchangers onto the compressor. The temperature of the air that goes into the compressor is higher than just ambient, and it reduces the workload of the compressor by a lot. Right? And as a result, they believe that you can get 30% lower energy consumption by your air con. Right? And this has been implemented with a number of places with HDP, with, with LTA, etc. in the public domain, and we have now uh, started to bring this into the private domain as well. Now, how we decided to make this decision was we basically said, okay, we're going to spend about double the cost compared to you know a normal uh, inverter technology. And when what we are comparing to is your top of the line aircon, right? So your Daikin, your Mitsubishi, the, the five star rating that you, you typically go for, we are comparing it to that because we're trying to make an incremental change using a new technology. And what we, decide, what we said is that if we are operating this aircon, right, for a certain number of hours a day, certain number of days a week, how long would it take us to actually get our money back? And over the life of the over the life of the investment, you know, what is the total impact that we can create, right? So each of these equipment actually saves us 83 tons of carbon over the eight-year life. We typically, you know, change your AC equipment between eight to ten years, depending on how the compressors, depending on how often it's been used. Now, because this is being used in a commercial setting, it's running for you know close to 14, uh, 14, 16 hours a day, especially in the common areas and guard houses and in lobbies and things like that. But a payback period was a key thing we looked at. We said that within three years, we can recover our initial investment that we made by adopting this technology, which is more expensive because it is obviously a, a, a you know additional equipment you're installing, but also more expensive to install because of all of the piping and systems you need. So that was one you know basis on which you make your decision, right? Is there a payback? How long is the payback? And what is the impact that you can create in terms of number of tons of carbon? The second one actually, which we did not do, is technology called low carbon concrete. Right? And there is a reason we didn't do it, and I'll tell you why. The total volume of concrete that we needed for our building was about 100,000 meter cube. Right? The cost of normal concrete would have been about 10, 10 million dollars, 10.1. We would have to spend about 700,000 dollars extra to use this low carbon concrete. And it would have saved us about 1,400 tons of uh, carbon, right? of carbon dioxide. In, in the atmosphere based on their 4 to 6 percent lower carbon uh, impact. The problem was that the cost per ton was working out at almost $500, right? And $500 for a ton of carbon is very, very, very expensive. You can take that same $500 and you can actually potentially get 10 tons of carbon uh, impact by investing into, let's say, a, a reforestation program in Indonesia, which is quite active. So, so something that actually makes you know, a similar impact uh, to the environment, right? So the idea, we decided not to do this because we said that our money is better spent and you can have a bigger impact. And, and I think the feedback that we gave to this company is that your technology needs to improve further or your scale needs to grow further before it becomes economically viable for a developer to do it, right? Because this would have really good, I would say, uh, publicity factor, 
but it would be a huge amount of money spent for you know very little part of impact. So we decided actually not to do it at the moment, right? Then a couple of things else that we did, right? One of the things that we did was we replaced all of our diesel generators on site with a battery pack, right? So this battery pack actually charges the battery uh, during the low peak period of power in Singapore. And these battery packs are actually used to power our cranes. So our, our you know, mask cranes, our you know, boom lifts and things like that, we use this to, back, to power them. Um, at the moment, actually, given the cost of diesel that you have in you know, Singapore, we actually save money by going to this solution. But more than that, we had about a 420 ton um, reduction in embodied carbon because of going to this battery pack rather than the diesel. And then the other impact was basically around noise and you know, air pollution in our surrounding. So because we were using a battery pack instead of generators, the noise levels at our construction site were much, much lower. And, and it, it was better from, you know, from our neighbor's perspective and things like that. So this one is something that you know, we, we, we continue to employ and, and, and do in our site. And then last but not least, actually, we have uh, just given Kia a project to actually replace our lights with Kia powered smart lighting systems. So what this will actually do is use scenario management primarily and other sort of machine learning feedback loops to reduce our utility bills by 30 to 50 percent, right? Now, the building is not operational yet, and we have just gotten into the partnership with Tuya. We've been having a conversation and we're talking about this, you know, for almost one year. But we are quite, I mean, I think the science is there, right? The science is there simply by sort of managing lighting in a warehouse setting that is. You can reduce your uh, the amount of energy that the lights use because you're not going, it's not simply motion detectors that turn the lights on and off, which would be unsafe in that environment, but it's about managing the lux levels depending on outside ambient lux levels as well as you know people presence, as well as time of day, day of the week, and things like that. The ability to then take that information and connect it to the HVAC systems in the building to have it to, to reduce the load of the HVACs when you know there are no people present. Now again, here there was a, a, a big impact when it comes to number of tons, and this is operating carbon, right? Because it's 388 tons over a over a 10-year period that we calculated. This is actually just one you know floor of the building that we have implemented right now. But once we can demonstrate, in fact, once the building goes live next year in, in February. Once we can demonstrate, in fact, that this saving does actually materialize through scenario management, you know, the plan is to roll it out to our 45 million square meters that we have across the impact in phases and, you know, as is feasible. So, you know, that's that's our sort of, uh, you know, take on how we are employing, you know, some of the, the, the IoT solutions to to make an impact and, and, and sustainably invest uh, in real estate. Thank you. Huge thank you, Jay, for that fantastic speech. Now, coming up next, we need to please welcome to the stage Mr. Spike True, the GM of Sustainability and Industry Ecosystems at M1 Enterprise Services, who is going to introduce driving sustainable growth through smart energy solutions. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, as the last second speaker, I'll try to keep this as quick as possible. One of the advantages of being last is that a lot of the cases that have been shared by our esteemed speakers earlier on has really been covered, so I do not want to uh, reiterate uh, whatever they have gone through. But very quickly, I think uh, I wanted to first give everybody an idea what is M1 Enterprise Service all about. Uh, I suspect those of you in Singapore will probably equate M1 to a consumer brand, but the enterprise services has been around for a very long time. So our vision is really to become the digital operator uh, in the region, right? And we wanted to basically power on uh, two key propositions. Number one, our digital network and our in-country assets, uh, leveraging on the expertise that we have uh, around our ICT capability. And number two, because we are part of capital, so capital is heavily involved in energy, uh, infrastructure as well as network, 
and that's the specific domains where we believe we are able to contribute and provide very specialized domain expertise around our ICT offerings. So um, we have uh, basically evolved quite a fair bit over the past few years. Uh, one of the key areas that we have done was to in organic acquisitions where we have acquired uh, a company called Asia Pack, which is heavily involved in managed ICT services as well as device as a service. So in most of those cases, uh, we have been fairly successful supporting a lot of government uh, agencies as well as large managed contracts uh, of uh, uh, large enterprises in Singapore in their ICT um, services. And of course, in the regional ICT and cloud services, we have also acquired a company called Brocom, which has helped us extend our footprint into Malaysia. And in that sense, we have also been able to uh, extrapolate some of our services to other regional markets, including Vietnam. So in a nutshell, if you look at our entire uh, service offering and our core proposition, connectivity anchors everything that we do. Right? So within the connectivity uh, uh, network infrastructure layer, we tend to add on a lot of the specific applications and services that we, we, we could have a, a play in or basically a right to it. So uh, 5G is primarily an operator's play. So within the 5G uh, network, we have also harnessed on some of the connectivity solutions, build up industry solutions, leveraging around the capital system. So capital uh, primarily in some of the industries requires certain solutions such as workplace safety, such as uh, uh, asset care. So this is the, uh, the, the, the specific area where 5G connectivity can provide quite a fair bit of uh, uh, value proposition and uh, advantages. Now, more importantly, we need sustainability space. We have also leveraged quite a fair bit around our enterprise and uh, digital solutions. This is primarily a transversal solution that address the company digital transformation scheme. So why is this important? I will run through it very quickly in, in, in a while. So this question I get a lot, right? So within the, the M1 uh, space for sustainability, we always, are, we always get asked, what is M1 doing in this space? Why are we talking about sustainability? We are example. But early on, if you have seen some of the presentation from uh, my esteemed uh, speakers over here, you have a CNN company, you have a real estate ERS REIT talking about sustainability, you have banks talking about sustainability. So there's nothing straight right, for an operator like us to talk about sustainability. We have been doing sustainability reporting for 12 years. It's just that we have been fairly low key, people does not realize it. But sustainability is a topic that is equally important to whichever industry they are in, right? And I think we are one of the very, very few companies in Singapore who has an SBTI target. So SBTI target, our science-based target, our targets for decarbonization has been certified. We have a commitment to reduce by uh, X percentage. Now, it's not a commitment that people make so easily. Right? You make that commitment because there is a belief that you're able to reduce by that percentage, and you have a plan to achieve that percentage. And for M1 and Capo as a whole, where we have the confidence to do that reduction, it also means we can take that knowledge, that expertise, to market, to share what we are trying to do and what we are going to do uh, within our business to the rest of the ecosystem. So that is the basic proposition in terms of what we bring to the table, right? The uh, connectivity and the industry solutions that help us become more sustainable, the ICT capabilities that we leverage on from our uh, uh, industry ecosystem for, uh, from our acquisitions and of course the capital uh, group of companies with their domain industries and their deep uh, understanding of the different operating uh, challenges within their sectors how do we come in to support those uh, businesses so driving sustainable growth requires a change in mindset right? the big big challenges that we have heard so far from many of the customers that we have spoken to is that sustainability is a contradiction to growth you cannot reduce your consumption if you want to do more, if you want to sell more, and if you want to have higher profit. So there is always a balancing act, a trade-off. And I think the secret in terms of what we are trying to push here is not to handle or reduce your growth, right? The idea here is to figure out how do we transform your business model, how do we change your operating model in order for you to embed some of the sustainability best practices. 
And I think one of the very good examples which I highly inspired was by Mr. Good earlier on, he talked about how a packaging, a simple box, could be repurposed after you have taken out the device to become a, a, a very nice uh, uh, holder, right, that you can reuse. So having that kind of uh, thinking behind reusability becomes a very strong business proposition that you can use to differentiate your brand out in the market. And having to have sustainability within the core service also means driving innovation and transformation within your uh, um, business. So every single employee you. in your business has to have sustainability at the heart of that entire proposition. So in that case, it becomes a very strong driver for you to spur product and business innovation. Right? You don't compete on price, but you compete on the entire proposition of what you can do to the uh, competitor's product using sustainability as a differentiator. And I want to basically give you a quick idea around this uh, energy savings uh, uh, smart pad, right? which uh, earlier on I think uh, Alex uh, highlighted. Very, very simple way of using a fan with a little thermostat uh, and a uh, human sensors to control the environment in which you are you know, in. So if you apply this on the consumer uh, environment, you get 50, 55% uh, uh, energy savings. We are not really that interested in the consumer space because we are in the enterprise space. And when you think about the enterprise space and how this can apply to your uh, Yahoo, your clinics, your uh, hair salon, this is going to be quite a major, major value proposition that um, can really help them to save quite a bit on their uh, operating costs. The venture for enterprises in Singapore is can work can already. Basically, in the consumer presentations from the diary put, it talks about the user experience, it talks about a very nice home and so on and so forth. In the enterprise space, as Mr. Jai has talked about earlier, ROI. Right? How much can it save? What is the best way for me to optimize this asset in terms of my carbon emission versus the dollar value? So in here, the apex coming up for a clinic is going to be extremely low. The energy savings that you're going to get is extremely high. Why? Because the business operates easily 10-12 hours. For home, maybe about 8 hours in small room. Business enterprises tend to have higher energy usage. This is going to be a higher strong proposition. This, this is why we think working together with Julia, rolling out such a solution, into the uh, SME market in Singapore is really going to change some of the sustainability uh, goals that the government is driving towards. Right. So what are some of the uh, energy solutions that we have put up? So within the M1, we believe tracking and reporting needs to come first. Right? If you do not know which is your energy emissions are coming from, where are some of the biggest emitters uh, uh, contributing to your end, end, end um, bottom line in terms of your emission uh, outcome, then you wouldn't know how to prioritize your decarbonization uh, roadmap. And in order for you to be able to decarbonize over a period of time, you need very, uh, I wouldn't say very accurate, but you need a decent understanding of where each of the uh, emissions are coming from. And I would say a certain level of granularity is going to help very much. For example, we need this space how much would the lights be compared to the chillers, uh, uh, compared to the uh, projectors on the TVs and the PowerPoint. So each of these different energy consumption needs to be uh, measured and calibrated to account for their contribution. Then you would know whether spending a thousand dollars to replace the screen is going to make a difference or shift the needle compared to just changing the LED lights which might cost a little bit more but gives you a higher total uh, impact. Now, um, of course, we've seen a lot of all these devices that have been put up earlier on in the roadmap from uh, two years. These are some of the devices that are planning to go to market. I will not go into too much detail other than the fact that we need the M1 proposition. Uh, I mean, I had a very interesting conversation with Jerry earlier on. He's basically saying, hey, with uh, the operators, you guys have the biggest chance of rolling out um, such a deployment in Singapore in the shortest time. And I hope next year, when uh, uh, Ross does his new uh, success case. We will be one of the operators up there that will be mentioned about our success in Singapore. Right? 
So this is, of course, the uh, smart energy solution that we talk about, but we're not going to too much detail. Now, this is the platform that we are really, really interested in because this is the dashboard that will eventually tell the enterprises how are they performing, where are some of the optimization and improvement going to come from, and how would AI help them to promote or recommend the best setting of their business using historical trending and data. And this is something that will continue to run on and on based on how the business evolves. So it's not a installed once, then it run for two years and do nothing, right? It's about putting in the right hardware to do the tracking and let the platform itself run the, the uh, understanding of how your business uh, energy usage is contributing to the emission and fine tune from there. So a platform basically helps you to optimize your business on an ongoing basis, depending on the various changes. And we are excited of course, having a, a Zuya over here with the uh, platform to help us to enable this journey for the assembly uh, market. Now, our eventual outcome is not so much about creating a optimized decarbonization solution out of the market. It's also to enable the development of uh, uh, new solutions out in the market that we can onboard. So the best way to do it is in a forum like this, where there are developers, there are startup uh, uh, companies within the community who are eager to embark on this journey with us, who are eager to build very specialized uh, optimization solution or sustainability solution around specific sectors, and then work with us so that we can go to market and address some of the requirements uh, that some of these enterprises are looking for. So, uh, with that, I will end my uh, presentation. Uh, please, if you have any potential ideas, you want to have a quick chat with us, do come up to me and uh, we can exchange details that we can talk about. Huge thank you, Spike, for that excellent speech. And now we're pushing on to the penultimate speech for this afternoon. So please, everyone, can we welcome to the stage Mr. Sky Ho, the founder of Autolight Tech who's going to give us a speech on the application of AI to home energy saving systems. Welcome. Hello everybody, so my name is Sky, you can call me Sky. Okay. Let's go now. Okay. So, as you know, the topic for today, a lot of emphasis on energy and how we can optimize energy. Now, I've been talking to a lot of officers and homeowners especially, and one of the important questions they always ask me is, you know what? Relating to energy, they always ask, hey Sky, if I implement a smart system in my home, will it consume more energy? Will my monthly bill increase from 400 kilowatt hours to skyrocket to something else? Right? And it's my job to assure them that, hey, you know, with intelligent automations and the right products, we can save money and energy, and they are small just like that. Of course, I will be fun to implement this after seeing the data. So we already have a, a nice study which shows that there's 20% decrease in uh, energy and savings there just based on three products. And that's it. Can we actually do more than that? That's my question to all of you. Okay, now um, when, I, when I go to uh, visit people, right, they always come to one story. And it's actually very common. A family comes back from overseas and they realize, hey, why is my aircon still on? And they go to the aircon and below the aircon they see, hey, why is there one puddle of water? And they tell me, the puddle of water goes into a carpet tree, the carpet tree opens up the crack for the water to sit in, the carpet becomes moldy. And actually, if you go around to homeowners, this particular problem is more common than you think. Okay, it actually does happen quite a bit. Every single officer, you know, you the first facilities manager will come and say, hey, today, one more time, again, somebody in the room didn't off the aircon. What does it do? As we all know from all the talks previously, aircon is the number one, one of the highest energy consuming products, uh, uh, smart appliances out there. Okay, now, can we do better? And that's my question to all of you. Can we do better to reduce and go green? Now, 
we are at, at a convergence of two exponential technologies. One of them, as we all in this industry already know, is IoT. The other is AI. And we combine all of them together to achieve a greater result. And hopefully by the end of this call, I'll convince you that, hey, there is a possibility over here. So AI, we all know that AI exists. It's all the high tech GPT. Recently, I was trying to do one example where I tell the, uh, the assistant to create something and display it on the TV. It auto generates the image and displays on the TV, right? Uh, Google Home is an example of uh, natural language processing for you to on and off certain things in your home. So that's AI. But AI in your home to actually control everything instead of using the automation that you have to manually script in. Is that actually possible? Well, it is the future with data. Okay? And how does all this affect? It affects energy. And energy is as we all know from the previous talk, money, you know, value. Before I touch on the future, I'd like to go back into the past a little bit about the history of how we actually go about to measure energy. So, we all know Thomas Edison, right? Who doesn't know Thomas Edison? Everybody knows. We know that Thomas Edison actually created one of the first ways to measure electricity. And here's the catch. It is not through physics. It is through chemistry to measure electricity. Over here, we can see that Thomas Edison uh, created one of the first chemical meters. How does it work? After each month, through electrolysis, the metal actually builds up, builds up, builds up. Somebody comes to the house, takes it, scrape off the metal, put a weighing scale, which I don't know how accurate it is, and they weigh in and then they tell the homeowners or the last time officers, the today's context officers, they say, okay, based on how many grams of copper I've scraped off today, here is your energy bill and here is your energy readings. Of course, technology has improved. We do see this steam thing in homes, which people are familiar with, and this thing goes round and round and goes click, 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 and the number goes up. Therefore, you measure your energy. What's next? Singapore has already rolled out all the smart meters. In this smart meter, it is a way for it to communicate directly to the power company for you to monitor. How useful is it for homes? That's the question. For all of you who own homes, you see the money bill, oh, 400 kilowatt hour, how much you have to pay. But my question is, which device, which, which is the corporate which is causing the spike compared to last month, a 20% increase in monthly bill? And therefore, how can we improve it? Well, we need to have three things. Firstly, we need a more detailed way to monitor energy. How? How so? We know the monthly energy, but do we know daily? Do we know hourly? Minute or even better still, a real time update of what's happening right now. Right now. And the second one is can we actually make strategic decisions based on that? And how do we make decisions based on you know, which is the culprit of the home, right? Is it the aircon? Is it the lighting? Right? Is it some appliances? Maybe the heater has been turned on for the last 24 hours as consuming a lot of energy. So, going through the history of the energy, last time there's no data. Okay, last time there's no data, we all need guesses. We have some information, right? We still need guesses, but a little bit more intelligent. Maybe, maybe the future is that the data comes in, right? And the AI will be able to recommend stuff to us of which appliances we turn on, which appliances we turn on, or maybe perhaps even better to set a smart automation for it. And the future future will be one that the AI just totally manages everything for us, turning on the appliances, reducing the temperature, increasing the temperature for our folks and our, our offices. So algorithms and real-time analysis. Right? We want to be able to determine the behavior of appliances and as a benefit also can predict 
the lifespan of some of these appliances. So interestingly enough, I was uh, at someone's house and he measured everything in the home, right? Every single socket, every single light bulb, every single aircon, even the aircon is split up. So, and, and he tells me like this, uh, Sky, uh, is it possible that I don't service all my aircons? I just want to service the ones that I need to service and then half a year later then I service the rest. And I say like, hmm, interesting. Well, that makes a lot of sense to save more money based on the usage of the aircon because you don't use them you don't need to actually service the aircon. So okay, we do some tracking and we do some monitoring and we create alerts for the homeowner to actually service the right aircons at the right time. Yep. Uh, earlier on, uh, Alex did share about uh, how the temperature and humidity affect us, how we feel right now. Right now in summer Singapore, we want it to be nice and cool, nice and cold. Maybe halfway around the world, we want it to be a little bit warmer. One more factor to consider, because hey, we just we don't want to just optimize for energy, we want to optimize for human performance. That means in the office, you want everybody to be alert, everybody to be alive, to be able to work efficiently. One downside about having all of us in this stage right now is the oxygen that we all breathe in and we produce carbon dioxide. So if there's no ventilation, what happens? Right? Our oxygen level drops down and our carbon dioxide level goes up. And therefore, many of you, maybe you feel less alert, a little bit drowsy based on the decrease in carbon dioxide. So for larger offices, usually I'll take in consideration the ventilation of the carbon dioxide or oxygen level too. Now, uh, 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 our speakers have already kind of shared about daylight savings and how it affects outside light supplementing our indoor lighting to create the best optimal performance, human performance for all of us. Now, let's talk about homes, right? All of you live in homes. In Singapore, the Singapore majority of the people live in what we call BTOs or built to order homes or some people call it HDB, right? Now, in this estate, we do not really have the breakdown of day to day, hour to hour, second to second data. And that's my hope. My hope is that, as we have a smart nation in Singapore, that every home will have a way to monitor, right? To be, this kind of data is useful and pragmatic. One way to do it is put every single device, a smart socket, to your smart socket, to your smart socket, maybe use the to your CD tab or current transformer tab to clear, clamp onto the wire and measure. Well, sometimes that might not be feasible, especially if you want to scale up for all of Singapore. Is there a better way to do it? Yes. Let me introduce you to this word. It's called NILM. It's non-intrusive load monitoring. Which means to say, with the DD box or just the circuit box and having the energy monitoring down there, we can kind of analyze the whole entire space the whole entire office and segment it. Why? Because we know that, you know, through all the data, we can see that different products have different energy signatures. Let's think about some of the energy signatures. Right? You on the kettle, it goes on 1,300 watts and then it goes off. Maybe some of the older homes you can see the light actually flicker on and off. So there's energy signature. You can know that the aircon has a certain energy signature your microwave, your heater, all have different energy signatures. By having one device in your TV box to use AI to kind of segment everything and you can know which one is uh, the power consuming uh, uh, item in the home, it's a much more scalable model and applicable for all homes and offices going forward. So that is non intrusive load monitoring. And of course, let's avoid disasters, like the aircon example I shared with you earlier. So in Pongo, we already have, uh, in Singapore, they have already rolled out, and uh, it's shared by the previous uh, speaker. They have uh, smart power sockets, and also uh, NIM uh, a box, a version 1 for it. Now, I'd also like to talk about how the we are productivity can use uh, other open platforms to further develop and further make it even, even more powerful and customized for each user's homes or offices. And one common platform that I commonly use is Home Assistant. And some of the 
database that's been stored could be variable key or graph and to display the information will be graphed on. And what I like about this is I can really customize it and put in a beautiful cute cute little problem and to be able to show what's happening within the home or the offices at one glance. So the facilities manager will be able to say, at one glance, okay, I know exactly what's happening. I want to turn off this aircon one click, one button press away. Oh, by the way, for this one, right, how this sequence goes, uh, actually did some uh, energy optimization for this place. Uh, there is a sequence, I believe, that we could uh, learn from to optimize the energy. One way is before the, all the office users comes, we want to ventilate the whole place, especially those new places where there's a lot of VOCs, volatile organic compounds, entering the premises. We want to flush the air out, get new oxygen into the building, we close up the space, then we cool it down and purify it there. Okay. Now the place is nice and warm, uh, nice and cool for people to uh, work. So other stuff that I like to do with uh, the VR devices is I like to show graphs and, and dashboards, history graphs for what is on and what is off. Now, other, other stuff this can be for home, whereby we, at one glance see everything in the home. And for officers, what I typically find is that they like to have their own way to communicate to the technicians, the facilities, manage, management, uh, team to immediately go in there to troubleshoot in case there's a power spike or anything, uh, service of the aircon, immediately tap on the service team, which with the two your sensors you can integrate with Slack or Telegram or the platform of their choice or email. So here's some examples of energy monitoring between the homes, offices, and buildings that is all possible, custom made and graph for people to see. And it's kind of interesting because uh, this building could use actually the lights to indicate how much the power consumption is. So if the lights we display as 200 percent this okay, today right now is consuming a lot of energy. So it's more of a fun way and something which can customize for the user interface and user experience. So with that, uh, with that, I hope that uh, going forward. If there's two things that I want every home and every office to have, number one is good data, gathering of the data using uh, AI to analyze and provide the useful automations for us, optimizing energy while providing great comfort to all of us, and optimizing for human performance. With that, I end my speech. Thank you very much. Huge thank you for that great speech, Sky. And now, Last but not least, our final speech for today before we move on to the final section. Please welcome to the stage Ms. Wu Jingxian from Meta, who's going to give us a great speech on AI and the LLM's impact on the IoT industry. Welcome. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Xu uh, I go by JX. I'm a data scientist at Meta, supporting the lending product team in Singapore, uh, which is a sales office for uh, APAC. Um, I think when I first stepped into the room, I felt that I'm quite underdressed today, uh, compared to all the amazing ladies in the room. Um, but hey, our CEO wears the same t-shirt all year long, so I feel I could exceed his level. So next time when you see me, I will definitely be in a different t-shirt. Um, just now, Sky was trying to make a persuasion to you all that AI and IoT will happen. I guess me being here today is a validation point, at least to ya, think so, that it will happen. Uh, so now I'm going to raise the curtain a little bit and, tell, uh, and share a little bit of my perspective of how that's going to happen from a more techies perspective. Um, the second was, uh, was put together quite hastily, so it's comparatively quite succinct compared to the previous deck, but I hope I can make up with more of the verbal um, uh, chats with you all. Um, I will first give an overview of AI and large language models, um, and then I will skip probably the definition of IoT since you guys are all experts in this area. Um, 
And lastly, uh, I think more importantly, uh, share about my perspective about the importance of the intersection between AI and uh, IoT. Um, first of all, um, I think the IoT has a lot of applications, right? Where at your home, with the user, as well as with um, the factories, right? It's a network of interconnected devices that collects data, interacts with users, and process this data. Now, I think the key point here is that there is a growing significance uh, of the data generated by IoT devices. Uh, in the past, a lot of factories could have collected more data, but just because there wasn't this um, ability to process this data, uh, actually there wasn't a lot of work to actually collect, let, you, let alone processing those data. Uh, now, with the advance in AI, uh, many companies are actively collecting data, more companies are working on interpreting data, uh, building the models to understand those data, finding the hidden patterns, correlations, and anomalies from those data, and then more companies working on uh, pushing out actions or making decisions right, based on those data. Um, so, uh, I'll skip this. Uh, I think the previous uh, talks have all covered this. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, gonna skip, skip, uh, skip this slide. Um, yeah, as mentioned, there are enhanced technology from AI to uh, process the data collected, right? And we can recognize more pattern of uh, users' usage of those devices. Um, the AI could help in uh, making real-time decisions based on those data, uh, and more importantly, push the decisions, right, to take actions with the users. Uh, for example, when you see a, when a visual uh, camera sees a user probably in the danger of falling off, then the, uh, the visual image could be recognized that there is a falling object, and there can be push notification to the user uh, maybe the son or the daughter of the person or the parents of the, the baby that there's a potential danger and maybe uh, someone needs to take actions on that. Um, also with AI, there would be predictive maintenance, right, of the devices uh, on top of, uh, so that's going forward, right? The previous examples were just based on current situation. So with all the past data collected, the models could predict what's going to happen in future, maybe based on leading signals, the, uh, the algorithm could identify a potential machine failure ahead of time so that the proactive measures were taken and avoid a, a, a larger scale failure. This is more important when all the devices are connected and there's a whole ecosystem failure. Um, with anomaly uh, uh, detection, that is uh, similar to predictive maintenance. Uh, if we can identify something that is abnormal, uh, we can also be proactive in handling it. Uh, last, but, last but not least, uh, with all the data collected to the user, so the first one is to, to the model uh, or to the platform, second one and third one are to the businesses, and last one are to the users, right? AI could help uh, with more user level customization because of the large computing power, whereas before the solutions were more generalized, but while well, all users have the same app interface, but in future, uh, AI could empower a more customized or sort of tier interface to users, similar to a lot of the to see applications we have today. Maybe each user will have a slightly different version of the app interface and features. There are different features exposed to elderly. Uh, there are different set of features exposed to uh, kids or parents. Um, yeah, and there would also be user uh, experience uh, improvement, right? A lot of AIs have been applied in the IoT industry uh, today. My grandma doesn't know how to use iWatch, but she knows how to give commands to Xiao Ai to turn on the television, right? So from that perspective, user experience has been improved a lot up to date and will continue to be improved into the future. Uh, and next I'm going to talk more about uh, large language models uh, and the significance to IoT. So what is large language models? It is a subset of AI. So AI is a simulation of a intelligence uh, to perform tasks that usually require human intelligence to do, for example, learning, right, uh, reasoning, or problem solving. 
whereas large language model is a subset of that, where it is specific way to handle uh, natural language processing, uh, uh, and then to understand and generate human languages. Examples of uh, the more widely used large language models today include uh, ChatGPT, first uh, Google's Spark or Calm, uh, and then my company Meta, we also have a Llama or Llama 2, which is launched recently. <laughs> Can I get a sense like how many of you have tried ChatGPT before? Uh, how many of you have tried Bart or Pop? How many of you have tried Lama, Lama 2? Uh, it seems we are, we are the third runner, at least among the three. Uh, not good, but I'm going to tell you uh, why you should try out Lama more. Uh, I love to try to be, by the way, I also love Bart, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm a proponent of Lama 2. Why? Uh, because uh, Lama 2 was launched just a few weeks ago. It was Meta's state-of-the-art kind of rendition of large language models. Um, compared to the previous version, it's trained on larger data. It has three kind of offerings for different types of business needs. And the number one unique sell uh, key selling point is that it's open source and free. Which is why in the previous slide, uh, I kind of split them into two groups, right? Uh, so Lama right now is, uh, is one of like the top uh, big one, uh, large language model that is open and free for all. Well, not exactly free for all. Um, it's not free for services for more than 700 million users. We, we, don't, we don't let Google use it. We don't let Amazon use it. We don't let, what's the other one, Apple use it. Uh, but that's all. Uh -huh. So uh, that's number one. Number two, Lama 2 is trained on more updated data. We use data up to this year. Whereas ChatGPT uses data up to, I think, middle of 2021. So the data is more up to date. Uh, number three, because of all the happenings to Meta before, Cambridge Analytics and those stuff, our company has been more cautious about the risks with AI technology. And thus, Lama 2 model is, is, is better fine-tuned with negative data samples from high-risk content or harmful content. So for businesses, Lama 2 model, uh, at least from research papers, tend to perform better than the other uh, off-the-shelf large language models. So please do give it a try if you have that. Um, I'll talk about the use cases of large language model in another section. I think like, overall it's quite straightforward that LIM will be good in content design, but right? a lot of the companies are already using uh, large language models. They probably, they are, they will likely do better than a part-time contractor that you hire. It might not be the best uh, uh, content designer, but you uh, rely on it on general use cases. Uh, two, customer services, right? Because largely, compared to AI, LLMs are highly interactive, right? Uh, AI, you know, when you dump the data, there's a model, and then you put some testing data to try to have some prediction, uh, whereas, for a large language model, it's interactive. You can keep conversing with it, right, and tuning it, and give more prompts until it gives the kind of um, a key difference to AI. And this is a huge advantage for businesses who has a need for the customer service angle, right, where like they can maintain a more conversational, human-ish um, uh, dialogue with the user. Let me take an example, right. Uh, a typical case when you call into service provider. Uh, right now, a lot of the services are automated, but how is it like? It's like, if you speak English, please press 1. If you speak Mandarin, please press 2. For other languages, please press 3. And that's it, right? It's pretty much a role-based uh, automation. But imagine when you use large language models. Um, let's say there is this, there is this uh, uh, Everhart person called Vivian, and I'm calling into this uh, service provider, right? Hey, Vivian, uh, I have a really bad day today. Vivian, hey, Jax, tell me more about it. So, Vivian, this is what happened. The dryer in my house broke down, and it's raining all day today. My clothes are all damp. I have to wear my clothes all day. It's a really bad day for me. Vivian, 
Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Let me think about it. Hmm, I found there is a service provider who knows handymans, three handymans actually, living within one kilometer's distance to your house. Would you like me to transfer your call to them? Think about it. How does this feel like? So this is the power of large language models to your business. And thirdly, about healthcare, right? I feel Meta's version of the large language model can position a better um, solution or a competitive edge for your business to this kind of like high risk, uh, better to be safe than sorry kind of industry. Um, so large language models in the landscape of uh, IoT, right? Right now there are some integrations of large language models of um, IoT platforms, but not as widely as common AI, right? The English or Mandarin, right? That's pretty common. It's um, audio recognition, right? With some rule-based or decision tree learning uh, based uh, uh, models. Uh, but not so much on LM just because it's so new. Now, what are the dimensions that this can be applied? So these are some of the, maybe just my personal perspective, and I would like to hear thoughts from the floor. Um, number one is the conversational interface and the virtual assistant for the devices. Right? Just the conversational interface, make it more human like the example that I gave just now. It's a totally different one than a very iron code kind of uh, if in English person, right? Uh, number two is the natural language coding and control of the IoT services. So not only they hear you, that you can maintain a conversation, but then they truly understand your needs and can help to implement whatever your command is to the devices. And thirdly, which is more importantly, they can probably mine the patterns right, of yours and of other users, uh, other users similar to you of how a better way that you can make command those devices and thus improve your life. Um, so with the application of IoT, uh, uh, application of AI to the IoT industry, uh, one outcome is that there will be enhanced uh, user experience. Um, number one, uh, improve human machine interaction right through na natural language. Number two, there will be personal personalized recommendations and responses at the user level. It's not a general message, right? You can probably even cater the message to, let's say, a working professional woman like me, or a say, at home grandma, uh, or maybe a young baby, right? In a more child, a more childish kind of voice, right? That the kid is more happily uh, responding to. Um, and I think there's a key feature for large language model, which is it's reinforcement learning, right? A lot of the current AI applications are uh, 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 unsupervised learning or supervised learning, right? Whereas um, LLM largely falls in the unsupervised learning uh, domain, but when it is applied to the IoT landscape, it actually transforms into reinforced learning, where when you first push the unsupervised learning model, to a common user, it instantly takes her user level data and inform her. It will know whether this person responds well to that first recommendation or not, and then it can adjust its recommendation to you. Just like nowadays, when you, when you converse with ChatGPT, you can modify your prompt until they give you uh, an ideal answer, right? Or when you play with midterm, right? You change the, 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 the imagined comment until the image looks more like you, for example. So I feel IoT will actually innovate a large language model from purely unsupervised learning to reinforcement learning, similar to the ad business, where the ad was first pushed to the user without knowing whether that user will click or not. But then over time, the algorithm will learn better whether this user will, will be more prone to let's say gaming ads versus let's say maybe there's a female user who is more prone to an e-commerce or shopping app. So that is where I see the next generation of uh, IoT and large language model kind of combination will be. We all know that the current AI applications in, within the domain of current AI application, ad business is the number one, right? Hundred billion dollar revenue companies like Google and Meta rebuild on that AI for ad business. Second is for search. I feel in the future with IoT and LLM, it can become the next ad business. It's hundred billion revenue uh, business in future. 
Um, the second implication of this applica uh, of the app uh, application of AI to IoT is about data analysis uh, and insights, right? First, the green part is extracting valuable insights from the IoT generated data. Second degree impact is about the contextual understanding uh, of user behavior and preferences. Uh, that is the technological advantage right, of uh, LLT, the, the, or the more based solution transformer. Right? It's better at understanding uh, 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 long, uh, long dimensional right, text data. Um, more, uh, and lastly, it will enable data-driven decision making for businesses, right? So um, for a lot of the businesses today, they probably operate without a very smart way, right? Whereas large language model can pass the understanding from users, right? Aggregate at, ag aggregate at business level and pass on to say, hey, maybe in future, right, your app uh, interface can be, uh, can be improved. Maybe your device can be customized, right, for each user, right? Or maybe even the uh, service, the software service that follows the, uh, the hardware sales can also be customized. So that is how the data analysis and insights can make a difference to both users, the platform, and the businesses. Um, of course, as any new beings, there are challenges. And with AI, with LLM, the challenges are probably more unforeseen right, and hard to predict. Uh, number one is privacy and security concerns, and I think the earlier presentation has also touched on this. Um, because the devices are owned at a user level, right, and it's not just ads. Ads is, meta is a social media, right? The posts are private, but then they are still open to friends. Whereas my iWatch data or any of the wearable devices, they are highly private my house data. That will be more sensitive data, right? And we need to be more deliberate about the, uh, about the data protection. Number two, um, because of the human-like experience LLM gives to users, and languages can manipulate people's decisions. And then there is this ethical consideration, right? Up until what degree should AI, large language models, or IoT, make recommendations to how people should I don't know, make their life decisions. So that is an ethical consideration here. Uh, number three is about the potential biases. And, and this is common across AI, right? Like garbage in, garbage out. The data is hugely uh, dominated by the bias within the training data itself. Uh, for example, if you ask or if you pull the, the English platforms, right, the social media about people's sentiment uh, 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 about the Ukraine and the Russia war, it likely will be more negative then if you pull the, 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 uh, the textual data from uh, Turkish language, right, or Hindi language, or, or Mandarin, or Russian languages, they might still be negative, right, in the spectrum, but then I'm just saying, like, they might not be as uh, negative. Um, so that is also a, a potential risk or challenge. Um, the fourth challenge is about security risk. It sounds similar to the number one point, but it's actually different in a way that because devices can action upon the insights, right? And then hackers, imagine you have a robot, human like robot in your home, he's doing house chores for you. But some hacker hacked it, and this robot now can do anything in your house. How creepy is that? So this will also be a huge risk that is unique to IoT industry. Um, despite the challenges, I say the future is still bright. Um, so to recap, the evolution of LLMs in understanding the text and nuances um, is top notch, right? And now with new advancements, uh, now there's a multimodal LLM. It can understand both text and images, and generate text and images. Uh, check out Lava. Uh, it's a it's the multimodal version of Llama, uh, so it understands both text and images. Uh, number two, the plus of, uh, uh, I think it's also touched upon that, like the integration of AIs and LIMs in edge computing for faster responses and also security considerations, uh, right? Um, the federated learning technology is becoming more and more mature, we can apply them, um, but there is also a question, right? I think it might uh, share just now, we also mentioned a lot of the edge devices, but then the question is, if the model is completely offline, how do we update the model after selling it? Uh, 
Um, so those are considerations that we still, we, we still need to bear in mind. Uh, the third possibility, the advancement in LG devices conversational capabilities. Um, I said like currently most models can maintain a conversation, uh, especially artistic conversation. But we still know that when it comes to scientific answer, a zero to one answer, LLMs don't do so well. Well again, Lama do does better because we train them more on scientific articles and news, news articles versus ChatGPT that are more trained on social media uh, taxes. Uh, and back to this point, uh, LLM technology changes everything. Tomorrow maybe another company releases a new model that does a lot better. So in terms of a future perspective, there is a huge upside right, on how this technology will advance over time. So I think uh, on this, it's more important to stay at the front line, know what's happening, and keep trying. Right? Like, you try the latest uh, technology, then another company will launch a new model. It won't be that different. Knowledge won't be that big. Right? So the point is, start now. <laughs> um, and that comes to the end of my presentation. Uh, and I'm not, I, I don't work in the hardware industry, I work in ads. Um, I didn't expect that I would be here uh, talking about hardware, but AI and LM brought me here. So I hope you walk away with uh, two things, right? Number one, uh, acknowledge that AI and, uh, and LMs have a transformative impact on IoT. Uh, number two, of course, um, keep an eye on responsible and ethical AI development. Thank you. Huge thank you, to Jingjian, for that enlightening speech. And that is the last speech for today, guys. But do stick around as we're moving on to the final section of today, which is our signing ceremonies. So, first of all, let's invite the signing representatives of Two Years Smart, Mr. Ross Floor, General Manager for Asia. Two Years Smart. It's a leading technology company focused on making our lives smarter. Tuya does this through offering a cloud platform that connects a range of devices via the IoT. By building interconnectivity standards, Tuya bridges the intelligent needs of brands, OEMs, developers, and retail chains across a broad range of smart devices and industries. Tuya solutions empower partners and customers by improving the value of their products while making consumers' lives more convenient through the application of technology. Through its growing commercial SaaS business, Tuya offers intelligent business solutions for a wide range of verticals. The company's platform is backed by industry-leading technology complete with rigorous data protection and security. Tuya partners with many global Fortune 500 companies to make things smarter, including Philips, Schneider Electric, Lenovo and many others. The scope of Tuya's business covers the whole chain from smart manufacturing to the application of smart scenes. At the same time, encouraged by the online and offline channel resources of the service providers, integrators and operators in Tuya's ecosystem. Tuya can help our brand customers to sell smart devices to the entire world. Tuya collaborates closely with Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Apple and Samsung in industry ecosystem. Our platform is one of the first that integrates Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, Apple HomeKit, and Samsung SmartThings at the same time. We enable brands to solve product development problems such as high development costs, long development cycles, and technical challenges and roadblocks, so that even companies with zero experience can quickly enter into the IoT space and enhance their product competitiveness. Tuya Smart, the global IoT developer service provider. Based on the underlying IoT past level technical support, we have developed smart business solutions for various industries, including hospitality, residential, building, community and office park, etc. The infrastructure behind our platform includes Cloud Plus Networking Module Plus App to enable the rapid development of smart products. Powered by Tuya PBT is a mark of interconnectivity across different brands and categories.
Users can easily control any product featuring the PBT label with just one app. Registered IoT device and software developers or registered developers were over 782,000 as of March 31st, 2023. From more than 200 countries and regions worldwide, smart devices powered by Tuya are currently available in approximately 120,000 stores all over the world. Better insights will bring more value into our lives, make our business and our homes smarter, but it's very important that it's in a secure way. So Tuya will provide it as well, securing the insights on our daily life will actually protect our privacy for the future. Together, we'll enable a future where life is more comfortable and joyful. Work is more dreamlined and efficient. Management is accurate and data-driven. Services and thoughtful and sincere. Security is tangible and reassuring. Cities are prosperous and full of possibilities. Every second the world changes before our eyes. Time flies by faster than we could have imagined. Every idea can open the door to a completely new era. For creation precedes prediction. The possibilities are endless and we're walking into uncharted territory. We invite you to take this journey with us. Tuya Smart, the global IoT development platform service provider.